What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to Bobby Dots Part 1. This is probably the story that you've all been waiting for, and I'm so sorry that it's been so late, but um, we are here now, so it's all good. Uh, I am currently on my work break. Uh, I get like half an hour, so <laughs> this is going to be in a... It's going to be like sloppy, probably, but I hope that you enjoy this, because this is to be enjoyed. This is the story, right? This is a two-parter, if you don't know. So I'm not just recording it in two parts. This is just ge genuinely like a two-parter. So uh, in Summer Canophobia, which is the fourth book, we have Bobby Dots Part 1. And in the fifth book, which is called The Bobby Dots Conclusion, we get The Bobby Dots Conclusion. And it, it is a two-parter confirmed because I already know what happens in the story, and I will tell you it is mind-blowing. It is also a massive story, so I think we should just get straight into it. Let me know if you enjoy down below, and make sure you subscribe so that you see when the Bobby Dots conclusion come out, co comes out. Anyway, even the grass... Nope, never mind. <laughs> even the greener grass has weeds. Abe smiled at the memory of his mother's words. Of course she'd pop into his head now. She always did whenever he was co coveting something he didn't have. And Abe was definitely co coveting. I don't even know what that word is. Coveting? Coveting? Big time. Emitting a fingernails on a chalkboard like Screech, Abe's vinyl desk chair protested as he leaned back further to get a better view of the Fazplex Tower. The narrow window near his desk in the Pizzaplex security office revealed just the tiniest sliver of the tower. But the sliver was enough to distract Abe from what he was supposed to be w focused on. Abe had a pile of work orders to get through, and he was trying to pay attention to an online leadership class, but he couldn't keep his gaze off the tower outside his window. Sun glinted off the sleek silver steel frame and the shiny glass of the 40-story tower, making the building look like the modern palace of a wealthy ruler. Abe could have sworn he could see a glow radiating from the building, but that was probably his imagination. He wanted to live in the Fazplex Tower so badly that it was larger than life to him. Abe sighed and tipped his chair upright again. He glanced around the familiar office. Compared to the greener grass of the majestic tower, this room was a weed-infested wasteland of yellowed scrub. The grey painted walls were decorated only with the Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex logo and a few curling Freddy Fazbear security posters. A couple of beige bulletin boards hung behind him covered with a disordered mismatch of notices and reminders. The floor's carpet, a slightly lighter shade of grey than the walls, had a star-patterned motif, but the stars did little to enhance the space. The desks, filing cabinets and shelving in the office were all black metal. Nothing about the office was comfortable or inviting, but it was, for the moment, the only real home Abe had. Abe returned his attention to his computer screen, as he tried to focus on the online lecturer's words and the work orders he was supposed to be getting through, the image of his mum's sweet, round, freckled face filled his mind. She'd had such a hard life, his mum. She was only 43, and she was in long-term care with a degenerative illness. Still, she never complained, even though she'd been married to a man who had made her life miserable because he was always trying to get to the greener grass. And... He taught his two sons to try to get there too. Hey, are you about done for the day, Abe? Abe looked. Uh, Abe paused the lecture and looked up at Rodin, his colleague and his closest friend. Dark-skinned and dark-haired and also ridiculously handsome, Rodin, who was also tall and fit, had a big, white tooth smile that was a magnet to nearly every woman who saw him. That smile was aimed at Abe now. Abe was able to resist the magnetism, but he still found the smile contagious. In spite of his wistful mood, he grinned back at his friend, even as he shook his own pasty red head and not any kind of handsome head. I still have a stack of these to get through. Abe tapped the work orders. Rodin's smile di uh, dimmed for a nanosecond. We'll all be at L Chips. You remembered it's Nell's birthday, right? Abe nodded, even though he'd completely forgotten. Sure. Flushing because of the lie, Abe looked down from, at his work. From the corner of his eye, he watched Rodin fuss with his longish hair. Rodin was not unaware of his good looks, but Abe didn't hold that against him. You haven't come out with the crew in weeks, Rodin said. What's up with that? Abe shook his head. Sorry, I just have a lot. You coming, Rodin? We're waiting. 
a woman's voice called out. Abe recognised the voice. It belonged to Carol, who worked in the admin offices. He didn't know her well, and he didn't want to. She was loud and pushy. But at least she'd spared him the strain of coming up with a believable story about why he never went out with his friends anymore. Coming, Rodin called back. He gave Abe a long look. Don't work too late. Abe didn't have to reply because Rodin strode out of the office. The four other people who shared the space trailed after him. Abe was now alone in the big, dingy room. The computer screens on the other desks glowed and the overhead fluorescent lights hummed. The electronics were now Abe's only company. Abe tapped his keyboard and started his lecture again. He forced himself to focus on the work orders. Abe's soft-soled shoes slapped thin, beige, industrial-grade carpet in a shuffle-tap cadence as he cautiously negotiated the back halls of the pizzaplex. It was nearly midnight, and by now the pizzaplex was mostly deserted. Just a couple guards patrolled the complex, and for the most part, they stayed in the public areas. Even so, another guard monitored the video feeds in the main security viewing room, so Abe had to be careful to avoid the cameras positioned throughout the pizzaplex. Electronic eyes were everywhere, even in the employee areas. Not for the first time, Abe shook his head at how bland the back areas of the pizzaplex were. The public areas of the entertainment complex were all about colour and bright lights. Neon pulsed everywhere. Everything was painted, some eye-boggling, vibrant hue. Back here, though, all was subdued. Varying shades of grey paint on the walls joined the beige carpet in the halls to paint a bland canvas of dull. But at least there were fewer cameras back here. That was what made it possible for Abe to do what he'd been doing for nearly two months now. Abe worked his way through the hallway labyrinth, and he finally reached his destination, the trash collection area behind the main dining room. There, in a dark brown and only mildly smelly dumpster, he found what he was looking for, his dinner. Abe pushed aside a pile of paper cups and shifted through a stack of half-eaten pizzas. Rejecting pizzas that had bites taken from them, Abe finally snacked two... Uh, relatively untouched pieces of sausage and sun-dried tomato pizza from a disposable pizza pan. Pulling out the paper towel he'd plucked from the men's room, he transferred the pizza to the towel, and he scurried down the hall to a dark, unmonitored corner. Sinking to the floor, he curled his lip at the sun-dried tomatoes. He carefully plucked them off the pizza, and then bit into the first cold slice. The shiny fat on the cold pork sausage had congealed, and its texture wasn't pleasing. But beggars couldn't be choosers. At least there were whole pieces of pizza. When Abe had first started working at the pizza plex, he'd loved pizza. Having a pizza every day was part of the job. Now not so much. Pizza wasn't good when it was your only choice. Chewing slowly and listening to be sure he remained alone, Abe tried to remember when he'd had choices about his life. It wasn't that long ago, but it felt like forever. Abe hadn't dreamed of working at the pizza plex. He had planned to be an entrepreneur, like his dad. Abe's dad hadn't yet succeeded in any of his business ventures, most of which bordered on Shady, but Abe had been sure he'd been able to do better. He figured he had the best of his dad and his mom. Like his dad, he was a big dreamer. He had vision. Unlike his dad, though, Abe cared about other people. He didn't just want to make money, he wanted to do good in the world, like his mom. Until she had gotten sick, his mom had been a house cleaner. Her whole adult life, she'd clean the houses of people who had the kind of money Abe's dad was always trying and failing to get. But she was okay with that. She said her work made life better for other people. Abe liked that idea. He wanted to do that too, but he also wanted to be happy and comfortable. Although parents didn't have the money to put Abe through college, um, Abe had mad tech skills. He was self-taught and he was good. And now he was taking the online classes he needed so he could get a promotion to team leader. That promotion could turn his life around. Abe was gnawing on the last of his pizza when he heard a clink about 30 feet away. He quickly looked at his watch. He swallowed the last of his pizza and he stood, scurrying down the hall. He'd cut it close. The sound he heard was the approach of one of the guards. Abe weaved his way through the halls behind the venues and ducked into a tunnel that extended away from Roxy Raceway. He paused and listened. He didn't hear anything. The security guard was taking in his time. Although the back hallways and tunnels of the pizza plex were dimly lit, the area was relatively bright. The pink and purple neon lights of the miniature raceway spilled out over the metal floor tiles of this behind-the-scenes area. Abe easily worked his way beyond a row of junk cars and a couple stacks of engine parts. 
On the other side of a pile of crates, he ducked down and scooted past the neon pink wheels of a motorbike lying on its side. The bike hid a small opening in a mound of race car tyres. Abe dropped to his knees and crawled through the opening. After just a few feet of crawling, Abe ended up inside a tent-like enclosure of rubber that sheltered what Abe, for hopefully not much longer, called his bedroom. That's right, everyone. Abe is living in the bloody pizza plex. <laughs> um, I think I think I'll say it right now because um, like there's no good time to say it. I mean, it'll probably be obvious um, at some point, but like this pizza plex is the most accurate description of anything we've ever had in the books ever. I think genuinely. Um, if you like follow his route through the pizza plex, you can actually follow that same route in Security Breach. No joke. Like everything in this story is super super accurate, which leads me to believe that it is actually part of the of the game timeline. But uh, we will talk about that in a bit because there's a few other details I will want to point out later. Anyway, after just a few feet of crawling, Abe ended up inside a tent-like enclosure of rubber that sheltered what Abe, for hopefully not much longer, called his bedroom. Abe scooted onto his sleeping bag and checked to be sure the cardboard box next to the bag still contained the clothes and toiletries he'd stashed in it. He really didn't need to check it. The sleeping bag hadn't been disturbed, so obviously no one had been here. His hidey hole was still a secret. Abe stretched out on top of his lumpy sleeping bag and inhaled the familiar scents of rubber and motor oil. He was tired, but he was also wired and tense. These days, he was always tense. That's what being homeless did for a person. You never felt safe and secure, especially if you were camping inside a place like the Pizza Plex. Although Abe's job included servicing many of the animatronics in the Pizza Plex, he wasn't a big fan of the robots. Roxanne Wolf was one of his least favourites, and her raceway was her lair. Supposedly deactivated by the time of night, by this time of night, sorry, Roxy probably wasn't any kind of threat. But a couple of weeks ago, as Abe had been heading to his hidey hole, he'd gotten a glimpse of Roxy stalking past one of the doorways to the raceway. It had freaked him out. Since then, he'd been even more on edge than usual. Abe lift, uh, listened for several seconds and assured himself that he was still alone. Satisfied, he pulled out his laptop so he could write his daily email to his mother. Hi, Mum. Did you have a good day today? Did you get the lemon jello you like? Or was it the cherry you hate? Smiley face. I'm doing great. I'm still taking classes. That promotion is going to be mine soon. I'm all settled into my cosy room now, ready for sleep. Wish we were together so we could watch a good movie. I love you. Abe. Abe sighed. He didn't like lying to his mother, so he thought of this as bending the truth. His room was as cosy as he could make it. The only thing that made these emails possible was that his mother's dementia kept her from asking too many questions. Abe closed his laptop and set it aside. He, cl he tried to clear his mind so he could go to sleep. But as often as it often did, his mind meandered down the road that had led him to this rubber-enclosed den. A year before, after several failed online business attempts and several more dead-end jobs, Abe had landed his current position at the Pizzaplex. Getting the job was a feat, especially since he had none of the credentials the job required. Wink wink, Vanessa. <laughs> Accustomed to doing whatever it took to get uh, what he wanted, a talent from his dad... Abe had faked his resume. Although he felt a little bad about lying, he didn't think he was doing anything that terrible. He had, after all, every skill necessary to do the work. He'd just gotten those skills in ways that employees always dismissed as irrelevant. Unfortunately, right after Abe got the job, his mum was diagnosed with an early onset dementia. Within weeks, the dementia had taken from Abe's mum what little she had. The bank foreclosed on the house and his mum ended up in long-term care. By then, Abe's dad was long gone. He had moved across the country to chase after another questionable business deal. When Abe had gotten his job, he felt like he was going places. And then Abe's whole salary started going toward his mum's care. And with the house gone, he'd ended up here, in a makeshift tyre hut, living on discarded pizza and playing hide-and-seek with security guards every night. Abe closed his eyes. Listening hard to make sure nothing, human or not, was nearby, Abe willed his muscles to relax. He filled his inner vision with the image of the Fazplex Tower. If Abe could just hang in here, there, in here a little bit longer, he'd be moving into that tower. The lower 20 floors of the tower housed Fazbear Corporate offices. 
but the upper 20 floors were filled with high-tech apartments. The top half of the tower also included a common area for parties, a state-of-the-art gym, and a rooftop swimming pool and hot tub. All of this was reserved for the people who held the higher level positions at the Pizzaplex. These lucky people got to live for free in that tower. When Abe got his promotion, he'd be one of those lucky employees. With that hopeful thought in his mind, Abe drifted off to sleep. So, I'm sorry to keep pausing, but I do just have to say... That is probably why, if there are mega, pe- uh, if there are multiple mega pizza plexes, like some kind of phobia implies, that the security breach mega pizza plex is important because it is where the CEOs are, right? It is where the higher ups are, and we might even see this pizza plex again in the next story, which is the first one in the Bobby Dot's conclusion, which is about the the higher ups and their um, you know, the creative team or whatever, the team of directors. That yeah. Anyway. I just thought that's interesting. Uh, Abe hesitated at the double doors leading out into the main lobby of the Pizzaplex, rubbing his sore lower back. Sleeping on the floor was taking its toll on his spine and his joints. He listened. It was early, well before 6am, and the Pizzaplex was hours from opening. The cleaning crew, which worked in the pre-dawn hours of the morning, would be clocking out right about now. The security guards usually took a break about this time. The way was more... Uh, the way was more... The way was more than likely clear, sorry, but Abe was always careful. He couldn't afford to be caught. When nothing but silence met Abe's ears, he gently pushed open one of the doors. He looked right and left down the main walkway of the pizzaplex. Although all the neon signs and decor were lit up, the black and white checkered walkway was deserted, as Abe knew it would be. This time of morning, the pizzaplex smelled like bleach and floor polish. The acrid smells bit at Abe's nostrils as he stepped out into the walkway, sidling sideways, or yeah, sidling sideways, so he could stay in a blind spot between the trio of security cameras aimed at this area. Abe had studied the camera positions and watched video feeds for hours when he'd first come up with the idea of living in the pizzaplex. He'd been relieved to find out that the video coverage wasn't at all optimal. It was easy for him to find a variety of convoluted routes between his office, the dining area, his hidey hole, and where he was headed now. One of the large men's vest- rest room- uh, rest rooms! Ah! <laughs> Abe began his series of zigs and zags. First, he skirted around the huge gold statue of the Pizzaplex's lead animatronic, Glamrock Freddy, wink wink. The massive bear in the top hat held his mic stand and lauded it over the lobby. Once around the statue, Abe darted to one of the several palm trees that filled the cavernous space. He moved from tree to tree until he passed a neon sign for Glamrock Gifts. From there, he pressed himself to the wall and sidestepped past the entrance to the Pizzaplex's lounge, the Fazpad. Finally, he pushed open the door to the restroom. The bleach smells were even stronger in here, and Abe's nose tingled as the door whooshed shut behind him. Hurrying to the nearest sink in a row of white sinks that lined the white tiled wall, Abe pulled out a battered vinyl toiletry kit. He dug out what he needed to get himself ready for work. Abe had gotten ridiculously proficient at taking spit baths. That's what they called a showerless or bathless bathing cleansing in the Old West. He liked to think of his daily routine, sort of scrubbing himself with wet soapy water, uh, paper towels, and then fl- uh, following that with the wet towel rinse seemed a little less pathetic and a little more adventurous. In a matter of minutes, Abe was satisfactorily clean, and he moved on to shaving and brushing his teeth. As he consciously at- attended to each of uh, of his pearly whites, his teeth were one of his best features and he had to make sure he didn't need dental work he couldn't afford, Abe stared at his image in the mirror. When he barred his teeth to brush them, he his face sometimes looked more like his mum's than his own. His mum had a big smile, not unlike Rodin's. Abe's smile showed a lot less teeth. It was shy and a little lopsided. Abe had gotten most of his looks from his mum. He'd inherited his mother's curly auburn red hair. She wore hers shoulder length, but Abe kept his trimmed close to his head. And freckled complexion. He also had her blue eyes and the soft features that made him look about as threatening as a teddy bear. A plush one, not an animatronic one. The only noticeable physical features Abe had gotten from his father were his height and lanky build. Abe thought about his mum, about how much she liked the yellow painted room and the care centre. Her contentment helped him cope with his living situation. As long as he was able to take care of his mum, he would never be homeless in his heart. Aww. 
Just as Abe was tucking away all his toiletries in his Doppler kit, the restroom door flew open. Abe quickly hid the kit behind his back and turned. Hey Abe, what are you doing here so early? A short balding man wearing a Pizzaplex team leader shirt asked. Hey Evan. <laughs> Not another Evan, no. Abe was conscious of the guilty flush that heated up with his cheeks. He pretended nonchalance with a forced chuckle. That's probably a better question for you. I thought team leaders didn't have to keep such early hours. Abe's deflection worked. Evan, one of the lucky guys who got to live in the Fazplex Tower for free, laughed. That's true, usually, Evan said. But I left early yesterday to go catch my kids' hockey game, and I have some catching up to do. Oh, I have some catching up to do. I couldn't miss the game. One of our Bobby Dots taught my kid a new move. Evan laughed again. You should have seen him racing around our apartment with the Bobby Dots cheering him on. They're such a hoot. Bobby Dots? Abe asked. Evan had started toward one of the stools, but he paused. Oh, you don't know? The tower's apartments now have holographic systems. State of the art. Totally luxe. He continued onto the stool. Sorry, I need... Abe nodded. Sure. He hurried to the restroom door, shifting his dop kit so Evan wouldn't see it. Have a great day, Evan called out as Abe left the restroom. Shaken by the close call, Abe retraced his steps to his hidey hole. As he trotted through the lobby, Abe looked up through the glass ceiling over her head. The sun was rising, and by tilting his head at just the right angle, after he passed Golden Glamrock Freddy, Abe could see the top of the Fazplex Tower. Soon, Abe thought. He was going to have one of those Lux apartments. Very soon. Soon. <laughs> uh, this is this is great so far, but I'm gonna have to go to work, so I will cut right now. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> All right, two hours into his workday, Abe got a call requesting that he report to the administration offices. His hand shaking as he hung up the phone, he stood. Rodin looked up from his computer screen. Where are you going? I wanted an admin. Rodin leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. Uh oh, what did you screw up? Abe shook his head. He didn't know. He'd never been called to admin before. Was he being let go? What would he do if... Well, you better go, Rodin said. When admin says jump, it's best to jump. Abe waved to Rodin and left the office. He tried to tell himself he was worried for no reason. He'd been getting good performance reviews. That was why he thought he could get the promotion he wanted. The hallway widened and the beige carpet gave way to plush red. The decor brightened too. No grey walls or curling posters here. Sunny yellow walls were hung with framed colourful paintings of Freddy Fazbear characters. Abe reached the end of the hall. He pushed open the polished carved wood double doors that led to the administration offices. He took a deep breath and stepped through the doors. Beyond the double doors, a young, slightly nerdy receptionist looked up from a long, narrow desk. Abe Sayer? Abe nodded. The receptionist pointed down another hallway. Second door on the left. Abe gave her a nervous smile and went in the direction she'd indicated. Sweat trickled down his back as he stuck his head through the open second door on the left. A grey-haired woman in a pale pink business suit looked up from a glass-topped desk. A uh, topped desk. Abe? Abe nodded. The woman gestured toward one of the two red plush chairs. Sit, sit. Abe sat. The woman came around her desk and sat in the other chair. She held out a hand, heavy with gold rings. Abe shook the hand. I'm Margaret Waterman. <laughs> oh, God, the woman said. New director of personnel. Nice to meet you, Abe said. His mouth was so dry he could barely get the words out. The new director. New directors often made cuts. Was Abe one of those cuts? My predecessor apparently didn't like face-to-face -face meetings, but I do, Margaret said. So I wanted to call you up here and speak to you directly. Oh, okay. Abe squirmed in the too soft chair. Have, have I done something wrong? Margaret raised an eyebrow. Not that I know of. On the contrary. I called you in to tell you that the promotion you applied for is yours. Abe blinked. Just to be sure he'd heard what he thought he heard, he replayed the words in his head. Yes, yes, she said promotion. Abe leaned forward. 
I thought the position wouldn't be available until it opened up sooner than we expected. Margaret reached for a folder that lay on her desk. She flipped it open. I see that you haven't yet received one of the certificates needed for the position, but you're enrolled in the requisite class, correct? Abe nodded several times. Excellent. Well, your job performance is superb, so we're willing to give you the promotion conditional on you completing certification within the next month. Would that be a problem? Abe shook his head. Not at all. I can do that. Margaret stood. Abe managed to stand too, although his legs were so rubbery from shock and relief that he was surprised they held him up. Congratulations, Abe. Margaret offered her hand again. Abe shook it. He grinned. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I won't let you down. I'm sure you won't. Margaret escorted Abe to the door of her office. Go ahead back to reception. Peggy will set you up with your Team 2 leader badge and fill you in on the next steps. Thanks, Abe said again. He practically floated out of Margaret's office. For the next hour, Abe was caught up in the next steps, but finally he was able to head to the Fazplex Tower administrative office. Abe didn't so much walk into the burgundy plush carpeted office as he sailed in. He was so over the moon about getting his promotion that he couldn't stop grinning. The administrative offices of the tower were everything Abe would have expected them to be. In addition to carpet that felt like it was cuddling his feet, the offices were filled with rich bright colours, primarily yellow and burgundy, shiny chrome light fixtures, gleaming dark wood panelling and furniture, and crystal clear huge windows looking out over the peak suplex. A petite blonde who wore a dress that matched the decor was perched on a stool behind a long counter. Can I help you? Oh wait, that's that's not a female's voice. Can I help you? Jen asked. I mean, females can have whatever voice they have, but yeah. Uh, Hi Jen, I'm Abe, Abe Thayer. I was just named Team 2 Leader and I'm here to get my apartment assignment. Jen flashed him a big smile. Congratulations, Abe! She clacked pink painted nails over her keys on her keyboard. Let's see here. I don't know why it's so... I, I don't know why I can't do voices today. <laughs> or at least consistent voices. Jen tapped the keys and leaned toward her computer screen. There you are. I'll just... Oh. Jen's smile f faded. She looked from the screen... Uh, sorry for messing up so much. To Abe and back to the screen again. Oh, what? Jen chewed her lower lip, then twisted her mouth. She lifted her gaze to Abe's. I'm so sorry, but... There aren't any apartments available right now. None? But I thought the other tower had an apartment for every high-level employee in Fazbear Entertainment. Mine isn't a new position, so why isn't there an apartment for me? Jen looked at her screen again. Well, there is one apartment empty. Good, okay, so there's no problem. Well... Well what? Jen looked at her screen again. The problem is, the empty apartment is off-limits. What does that mean? Jen frowned. It means it can't be assigned. For how long? Jen checked her screen. She made a regretful face. Indefinitely. Some of Abe's fizz went flat, but not all of it. He leaned on the counter. What's wrong with the apartment? Jen shrugged. Doesn't it say? Abe persisted. Jen looked at the screen again. She shook her head. It just says off limits. But why? Jen shrugged again. I'm really sorry. I don't know. She looked up at Abe. She must have seen his frustration because she gave him a sympathetic look and leaned toward him. The apartments in this building are really high tech. My guess would be there's some glitches in the system in this one. Well, if that's all it is, I can handle that. I'm pretty tech savvy. I'm sure I can fix whatever's wrong. Jen frowned and shook her head. Oh, no, that wouldn't be allowed. If the system says the apartment is off limits, I can't let you move in. No matter what. I really am sorry. But... Jen shook her head harder. I'm really sorry, truly, but I have to go by what the computer says. Abe didn't care what Jen's computer said. Abe had gotten past more insurmountable obstacles than words on a computer screen. His whole upbringing had prepared him for this moment. He'd get the apartment somehow. But how? Jen cleared her throat. Abe blinked. He was so caught up in working through his problem that he'd forgotten she was there. He raised a hand waved to Jen and headed back into the, into the hall. How is he going to get into the apartment? Abe strode down the hall, thinking hard. At the main doors of the tower, Abe paused. 
He turned and rushed back toward the office. Jen, he said as soon as he entered. Someone is at the main door for you. He has a couple dozen roses. He says he needs your signature. Jen's eyes lit up. Roses? For me? Jen started around the corner. Oh, around the counter, sorry. Her shoulders slumped as she looked around. I'm not supposed to leave the desk. Abe shrugged. I'm not in a hurry. How about I man the desk for you while you go get your flowers? I'll just tell everyone who needs help that you'll be right back. Jen raised an eyebrow. You'd do that for me? Sure. Jen looked around. Then she smiled at Abe and hurried around the corner. I'll be quick, I promise. Take your time, Abe said. Please. He willed Jen to walk very slowly. Jen giggled. <laughs> You're very nice. <laughs> so I've been told, Abe winked at her. Jen waved and headed for the door. She looked over at Abe once. He waved at her. She waved back. As soon as Jen was out of sight, Abe raced around the counter and looked at her screen. She hadn't logged out. Good. <laughs> Step one of leaving your desk um, unattended. Do Windows L, aka lock your, lock your screen. <laughs> what the hell, Jen? You are not a good receptionist. Um, as soon as Jen was out of sight, Abe raced around the corner and looked at the screen. She hadn't logged out. Good. Keeping one eye on the door, Abe pulled the keyboard forward and typed quickly. Thankfully, it took just a few seconds to change the apartment status to active. Once he did that, Abe attempted to insert his name into the tenant spot. The computer, however, wouldn't let him do that. It wouldn't change the name. Landon Prout was apparently superglued into the system. Abe frowned and tapped more keys. Although Landon's name remained stubbornly in place, the screen prompted Resync Work Pass to Apartment Access Card? Abe clicked yes. The screen prompted Scan Work Pass. Abe glanced around and spotted a handheld scanner. He pulled out his work pass and scanned it. The screen immediately flashed. Work Pass slash Apartment Access Synced. Generating Security Clearance Badge and Updated Room Key Card. A 3D printer spit out a new badge and key card. Huh, <laughs> I reckon the 3D printer is probably one of those Freddy heads that we see in the in Security Breach. Uh, Abe snatched them up just as the sound of Jen's shuffling footsteps reached down the hallway. Abe rushed around to his former place on the other side of the counter and nonchalantly stared out the window. Jen entered the office a second later. The delivery guy didn't wait, she said. She sighed. I missed him. I'm really sorry we don't have an apartment for you. Abe shrugged. I understand. It's okay. He waved at Jen as he left the office. Striding down the hall back to the, the building's entrance, Abe looked at his new security badge and key card. Okay, so the key card wasn't technically for Abe's apartment, but the apartment was off limits to everyone else, and Abe now had the credentials to occupy it. That was all he needed for the moment. Abe had to go to work right after he got his pass. It was his first day as team leader and getting used to his new duties kept him occupied all day. Even so, he never stopped thinking about the apartment that waited for him. He couldn't wait to see it. In spite of his eagerness, Abe had, had to wait until almost midnight before he could head to his new digs. It wouldn't have been safe to retrieve his belongings from his hidey hole until then. It was even later when he finally got off the elevator on the 22nd floor of the tower. From the numbering system, Abe could tell that his unit was on the far end of a long hall. No problem. Privacy would help, would help him pull off his unofficial occupancy of the unit. The same thick carpeting that was in the administrative offices covered the hallway floor. The carpeting was great. It cut down on noise. The walls looked to be soundproofed too. The lower walls had polished wood wainscot, uh, wainscot, wainscot. Woven burgundy and silver fabric stretched from the wood trim up to an arched grey ceiling. Halfway down the hall, a couple of women excited an apartment. Oh, sorry, exited an apartment, laughing. Clearly dressed for a party, they came down the hall toward Abe, chattering happily. When they spotted him, they both smiled. Hey, one of the women said. Abe shifted his belongings so the box hid his sleeping bag. He nodded at the women. They hurried past him and he watched them go. He wished he could have been friendlier. It might have been fun to get to know women who headed out to a party after midnight. But for Abe's charade to work, he was going to have to keep a low profile. The computer might now see Abe as Landon Prout, but he wasn't Landon Prout. He couldn't cause any trouble or draw attention to himself, no matter what. 
Abe's key card worked. One click and the door to apartment uh, 1280 unlatched. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I wish it was 1280. No, it's uh, 2217. Abe pushed the door open with his foot and stepped inside his new place. The door snapped closed behind him. Abe set his sleeping bag and box on the floor. Abe looked around and smiled. The apartment wasn't huge. In one sleep sweeping glance, Abe was able to take it all in, but it was his. A small tile entryway edged up to a central living area that consisted of a sitting area, a kitchen area, and a dining area. The dining area opened up to an office on the left side of the apartment, and the sitting area opened up to a bedroom on the right side of the apartment. From where Abe stood, it looked like the bedroom had an ensuite bathroom. The apartment had high ceilings. Abe guessed they were 12 feet high. It made the apartment look more spacious than it was. The apartment's design contributed to the larger feel as well. None of the rooms in the apartment were completely closed off like normal rooms. Only the bedroom had walls that went to the ceiling, and the upper half of those walls were made of glass. All the other areas in the apartment were separated from one another with short half walls. Like partitions in offices, the half walls looked to be covered with sound dampening fabric. In light grey, they were framed with chrome. Each half wall was topped by a glass screen, also framed in chrome. The screens extended to about four feet above the half walls, and they were topped by six inch wide chrome shelves that were etched with a swirly design. Abe thought they looked cool. The apartment's decor was minimalistic in the extreme. The white walls were bare, save for a, a large flat screen TV on the sitting area wall. The granite kitchen countertops were white and bare as well, as were glass-topped tables. The dining table, coffee table and end tables were all of similar style. The plush grey tweed furniture had low square lines and the chrome light fixtures were starkly modern. Some might have called the space harsh, but Abe didn't mind its simple lines. At least it was neat and clean. And it was his. Sort of. Abe took another step. As he did, the nearest glass wall, rising up from the partition at the end of the sitting area, lit up. A bright-faced holographic girl, with what looked like long, hot pink pigtails, popped up on what Abe now realised was a see-through computer screen. Hi! <laughs> Wait, I want to get this voice right before I continue, because th this girl is, uh, is amazing. Hi! <laughs> Hi! Oh, there we go, I've got it, I've got it. Hi! The girl said. Her voice was sweet and high-pitched, like that of a perky cheerleader. Uh, hi. Abe studied the girl, and he realised she wasn't exactly a girl. Or at least, she wasn't exactly human. She was an AI and was interacting with him. It felt impolite to call out that she was merely digital. You're cute, the little girl said. Oh, why did I put little in there? You're cute, the girl said. What's your name? I'm three. Abe didn't answer the girl. Three. He was too busy staring at her. Three wore a white and grey bell-bottomed bodysuit, striped with the same hot pink as her long pink pigtails. She had a large heart-shaped face with unnaturally huge hot pink cat-like eyes. Her arched brows were the same pink as her hair, as were a large oval spot on her forehead and a large circle on top of her head. Her bow-shaped mouth, which was under a small protrusion that must have been her nose, was the same colour. Her pigtails, which more resembled streams of pink light than actual hair, were topped by hot pink and grey bows. Don't you talk? Three said. I thought all humans talked. If you don't talk, we'll have to figure out some kind of sign language or something. I'm not sure how to do that, but I'm sure I can talk, Abe said. You just surprise me, is all. Three giggled, and the neon pink of her pigtails danced around her face. You surprise me too. We haven't had any visitors in a while. We? Three waved a hand. Oh, never mind about that. What do I call you? My name's Abe. Hi, Abe. That's a good name. I like it. Three suddenly winked out. Abe blinked and looked at the now clear glass. Shaking his head, Abe walked into the kitchen. Abe had been thinking a lot about the apartment all day. He decided that the first thing he had to do was check out the entire apartment to make sure everything was working okay. If it had been closed off, something was wrong. Maybe he could find whatever that was. Abe left his box by the door and headed into the kitchen. There, he checked all the appliances, the lights and the garbage disposal. 
all the amenities worked out just fine. Abe was moving into the office area when Three reappeared on the half wall between the office and the dining room. That's not my area, Three said. But I make sure it's clean. That's part of what I do. I'm the diet and lifestyle, Bobby Dot. Abe turned to look at Three, who had struck a cutesy pose and was twirling one of her pigtails. Bobby Dot, he repeated. Abe frowned, trying to remember all the animatronic and holographic characters he'd worked on. He didn't remember any Bobby Dots. Bobby Dots are lifesavers. We're programmed to serve. Three curtsied deeply and gave Abe a wide, pink-lipped, aren't I adorable smile. Okay. Abe turned on the computer that sat on the office desk. It seemed to be functioning fine. He rotated back toward the kitchen and headed toward the sitting room. As he went, Three hopped from glass screen to glass screen, capering over, at, capering after Abe like an eager puppy. Abe tried all the light switches and lamps. My job, Three chattered, is to manage the household. I'm in charge of cleaning, getting supplies like your groceries, and I also monitor your health. My health? You know, your blood pressure, heart rate, blood sugar, all that stuff. Abe wasn't sure how he felt about that. It seemed intrusive, but was it really any different to one of those wrist devices that did something similar? Abe stepped into the bedroom. He sat on the bed and bounced a bit to make sure it was sturdy. It was. He checked the lights and the alarm clock. Then he went into the bathroom. Three trailed after him. I keep this room stocked too, she said. All your preferences are stored in my system, and I always make sure you have the best. Abe opened a medicine cabinet above a large square white sink. The cabinet was stocked with everything he'd need. He wouldn't even require his own stuff that he'd retrieved from his hidey hole. Abe poked through the cabinet. He picked up a razor and shaving cream, a toothbrush and toothpaste. He reached for, uh, for a small glass bottle filled with something red. He peered at it and frowned. It was hot sauce. Abe held up the bottle. What's this doing here? Oh, so, uh, never mind. What's this doing here? He asked Three. Three flipped her pigtails and struck a new jaunty pose. Abe noticed that the bottom of Three's shoes glimmered as bright pink as her eyes. All supplies are delivered to the holding area for the apartment, and from there, I program their distribution. I had this placed here because it's the best mouthwash. A Abe grimaced. He cringed at the thought of accidentally pouring hot sauce into his mouth, thinking it was mouthwash. Abe looked at Three, who continued to smile at him. Abe was beginning to see why this apartment was off limits. The hot sauce was an obvious glitch in Three's programming. It wasn't exactly a red alert glitch, more of a yellow alert. Still, Abe held up the hot sauce and looked at Three. This isn't mouthwash. I'm... yeah, it's hot sauce. Is stuff like this why the apartment is off limits? Three shrugged. Maybe. So? Abe set down the hot sauce. He stared at it for several seconds, then he shrugged too. Well, I guess it's something I can live with. To be honest, I expected something more serious. Abe headed toward the bathroom door. Behind him, Three's mouth opened and then her head split down the middle. The two sides fell away and the rest of her body flickered in and out of view. Sparks spit from an electrical socket near the counter. Pausing at the sound of the sparks, Abe turned and looked around. His gaze landed on Three, who had resembled her previous form. She gave him a bright smile. One of Abe's work responsibilities as a team leader was training new employees. Oh my gosh. I am so excited for, for all of you to listen to this. He'd yet to work out an organised system to get recent recruits up to speed, but there was an issue he couldn't put off, so he was using it as a teaching opportunity. <clears throat> Here we go. Abe strode through the glittery and gleaming West Arcade, dodging excited kids and gestured at a stage where a huge animatronic DJ Music Man was hanging out. Abe raised his voice to be heard above the pings and whistles and bells of the arcade games. Most of the time, Abe told his new under underling Preston, DJ Music Man is in his booth. Abe pointed at DJ Music Man casually, as if the thing didn't bother him at all. Preston was a quiet kid, not yet 20, 
According to Preston's resume, which Abe assumed was more genuine than his own, Preston was definitely capable of performing maintenance tasks like the ones he'd have to handle. Preston, though, wasn't exactly the picture of confidence. He was a husky kid with shaggy brown hair. His posture was hunched, and he didn't seem to have mastered eye contact yet. It looks like a spider, Preston said, eyeing DJ Music Man. I don't like spiders. Yeah, Abe agreed. I get you, but just remember, he's the creation. We're the creators. You're in charge. Abe was lying through his teeth. He felt no more in charge of DJ, DJ Music Man than he did of his brother, Vic, or his bosses. DJ Music Man appeared to be concerned about Abe's or Preston's dislike. He continued to snooze in his sound booth while Abe and Preston studied him. DJ Music Man did indeed look like a spider, a massive spider, nearly as tall as the room Abe and Preston stood in. DJ Music Man had a squarish head dominated by a wide mouth full of teeth that looked like piano keys. Beyond the teeth, the inside of his mouth glowed pink and white. Huge round black eyes that reflected the room's light were topped by blue brows and flanked a, a triangular shaped pink nose. The big cheeks on either side of the nose featured big blue dots that matched the brows. DJ Music Man's head sat on a body that contained a big speaker. The body was attached to six metal piston-like legs that ended in cartoonish white gloved hands. Taken separately, DJ Music Man's features were more comical than scary, but the combination, and the potential danger of the combination, was more than a little disconcerting. Abe cleared his throat and looked away from the freaky spider thing. When DJ Music Man is on the move, he hangs out in these tunnels. Abe gestured at a wide, corrugated metal tube, swirling with bright neon lighting. The lighting in these things is notoriously unreliable. It's going to... Uh, it's always going out or causing power surges that overload the circuits. One of your jobs will be checking and rechecking the generators in this section. He looked at Preston to see if he was listening. Preston swallowed hard and nodded. Abe gestured for Preston to follow him into one of the tubes. These tunnels are pretty convoluted, but you'll get the hang of them. This first one takes you back to the hallway. Or to a back hallway, sorry. Abe and Preston crawled out of the tunnel and ended up in a cement-floored hallway. Preston looked past Abe. Is that a bathroom? Preston asked. Abe nodded. Is it okay if... Abe laughed. You don't need my permission to pee. Go ahead, just be careful. Preston's sleepy brown eyes widened. Um, okay. Abe figured he might as well use the bathroom too. He followed Preston into the restroom. Preston and Abe did their business and stepped up to side-by-side -side sinks. Uh, why did you tell me to be careful? Preston asked. Well, sometimes... A scrape and scuffling sound suddenly came from right outside the restroom. Abe tensed. He grabbed Preston and pulled. Just as one of DJ Music Man's big puffy gloved hands shot through the bathroom's open doorway. Guys, this story is insane. <laughs> it's... The, the, let me, before I continue, I'm so sorry for pausing again, but um, this is amazing because I believe this was written before it was made in the game. Like genuinely, I think they wrote this and then they made Security Breach. And that to me makes Security Breach a lot better because they really put a lot of thought into everything. They put a lot of thought into this book series, of course. But, like this story in particular really, really shows that. I think, because it, it has a lot of good fan service, I think. Uh, it's literally the, literally the events of Security Breach, just with different characters. It's, it's really good. Preston screamed as DJ Music Man grabbed him by the leg. Thankfully, Abe was already dragging Preston backward and the puffy hand didn't get a good grip. Abe and Preston hugged the wall just out of the hand's reach. Both of them stared past the extended metal leg to the grinning face of DJ Music Man, which peered into the bathroom menacingly, which also happens in Security Breach. What do we do? Preston squeaked. We wait, Abe whispered. They stood stiffly, breathing rapidly. Why did he grab me? Preston whispered. Abe's whisper was even softer than Prest Preston's. Rumour has it that DJ Music Man originally had an experimental bouncer mode. Supposedly, that was removed. But apparently, the programmer missed a few lines of code. DJ Music Man lore! Yeah! <laughs> DJ Music Man's hand explored the area for a long minute. Preston didn't ask any more questions. DJ Music Man retreated. 
For several seconds, Abe and Preston pantsed, uh, panted in unison. Um, DJ Music Man finally disappeared around the corner. Does this job have hazard pay? Preston asked. Abe entered his apartment and let the door fall close behind him. He set down a box on the floor. When he'd moved in to the pizza plex, in quotation marks, uh, Abe, or inverted commas, sorry, Abe had hidden what few things he owned in various nooks and crannies in the huge complex. It would take time to get them all and relocate everything to his new apartment. He'd planned to start moving in his stuff the night before, but it had been late and he'd needed sleep. Abe was beat. He wasn't sure he'd done all that well on the job today either. Preston was so rattled that Abe wouldn't have been all surprised to find out tomorrow that he'd quit. Abe took a step toward the kitchen. The nearest glass panel lit up. Three, who was eating a large holographic sandwich, filled the panel. Hi, welcome home, Abe. The words came out garbled, as if spoken through a mouthful of food. The glass panel came alive with more colour and movement. Abe realised he was looking at two more bobby dots. One bobby, dot, do, uh, one bobby dot's colour was green, the other's was blue. Oh, for heaven's sake, the green bobby dot said. Her voice sounded young. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I've got to remember the characters, oh gosh. Like threes, but it wasn't as cutesy. It was more spoiled brat sarcastic than teeny bop. You know you can't eat. You're a hologram, you twit. Can too, three said. See, I'm eating. But you're... The green bobby dot sighed dramatically. Never mind. The blue bobby dot shoved three aside. Hi, Abe. Sorry we didn't get to meet you yesterday. Three blocks us out. This Bobby Dot also sounded like a teenager. Her voice was even higher pitched than Three's. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Um, but it had musical quality, as if she was almost singing her words instead of speaking them. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. I just wanted to be sure he had everything he needed. Three said in a mush-mouthed sort of way. You just wanted to have him all to yourself, the green Bobby Dot said. She faced Abe. Hi, Abe. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm too. Like Miss Glutton here, my job is to help you out. You're not nearly as helpful as I am, Three said. Like Three, Two had two long pigtails. Two's were bright neon green. She looked like Three, but her features were green and she wore a pair of round grey glasses. A little taller than Three, Two was sleeker too. She wore a bodysuit identical to Three's. Two ignored Three's comment. She adjusted her glasses and continued to speak to Abe. I'm in charge of news and information. I'll keep you connected to the outside world. I can answer any question you have and find you any information you need. I'll also handle any notes you might have, like tasks or shopping lists, and I'll do your scheduling. I'll remind you of appointments and such. Show off. Three showed the last of her sandwich, or swallowed the last of her sandwich, or at least she appeared to. The blue bobby dot flashed brighter. Hi, I'm one. I'm all about entertainment and media. That includes social media. I'll get you music and movies and dates. Mmm, yum. I like dates, three said. <laughs> They're good in cookies. <laughs> I love these guys. One rolled her holographic eyes. Her pigtails were bright blue and her ears were covered in a set of headphones featuring upright antennae that ended in glowing little blue circles. She also wore a grey and white bodysuit. It's nice to meet you, one and two, Abe said. Better late than never, one poked three in her round belly. Three ignored the prod. He's cute, isn't he? Didn't I tell you he's cute? One, who Abe noted was as slender as two, gave Abe a flirty grin. You are pretty damn cute. Those freckles are to die for. I wish I had freckles, Three said. I don't really like my freckles, Abe blurted. No one else in my family has them. Abe was shocked. He hadn't ever told anyone he didn't like his freckles, least of all a girl. But these weren't actually girls, were they? For some reason, he felt comfortable with them. Maybe that was because they were holograms. Who says you have to look like everyone else? Two said. She studied Abe. I'd call you moderately handsome. Wouldn't you, one? Absolutely. <laughs> one's, bright uh, one's bright blue pigtails appeared to grow brighter. Just the right amount of handsome. You're nice and tall, and you have a great smile. I think the freckles are endearing. 
Uh, thank you, Abe said. What do you want for dinner? Three asked. I'm still hungry. I'll eat with you. You're always hungry, Two said, using a green-tipped finger to push her glasses up on her nose. Yeah, and you're always a show-off, Three said. Abe laughed. I need to get a couple more boxes of my things, then I'll eat. Is there anything here to eat? The fridge and freezer are fully stocked, Three said. She put a finger to her bright pink lips as if she was thinking. It's all the stuff that the last guy ordered. If you don't like what's here, you just need to tell me what you want and it will be delivered. I'll get it to the right places in the kitchen. Okay, let me finish moving things in and then we'll go from there. We'll be here waiting, one said. I keep forgetting one's voice. It's not, like, defined enough, but she's just singing. She's just singing it. We'll be here waiting. Uh, her blue fingertips glowed as she pointed at the glass panel between the sitting area and the kitchen. That's our main terminal. You can input your request there or you can just talk to us. Think of us as the heart and soul of your apartment. We'll make it function to serve your needs. We'll provide synchronization and assistance in all aspects of your everyday life. That includes food, Three said. Abe smiled at her. Yeah, I get that. I love how Three is just always talking about food. <laughs> oh. A half hour later, Abe had brought in three more boxes and he was storing his belongings in the various drawers and closets in the apartment. The Bobby Dots were helping. Abe's new bedroom was as stark as the rest of the apartment. Its furnishings consisted of a queen-sized bed with a grey padded headboard that matched the bed's grey comforter, two built-in nightstands that cantilevered out from the wall, one long dresser and one narrow chest of drawers. I think socks should go in the second drawer, Two said. Top drawers should be reserved for papers and jewellery and the like. Who says? Three asked. Two flipped her pigtails haunt, haunt, haughtily. I have access multiple resources focused on optimal organisation, and they all agree that socks are best kept in second drawers. You just find things that support your own ideas, Three said. <laughs> At FNAF theorists. Um... Abe held up his hands. Ladies! Three giggled. Did you hear that? He called us ladies. He's a gentleman, one said. Quite gallant, two said. And still cute, three said. Abe shook his head, but he put his socks in the second drawer. He opened a battered suitcase and pulled out a few shirts. Three jumped from uh, the outside bedroom glass wall to the glass wall next to the closet. The closet already has a lot of clothes. I think most of them will fit you. Abe raised an eyebrow. Landon's clothes were still here. Abe crossed to a sliding door and pushed it aside to reveal a closet that was half full of men's clothing. Nice clothing too. Abe set aside his own shirts and began flipping through the hanging clothes in the closet. He had nice taste, didn't he? Two asked. Not the latest fashions, according to my research, but pleasing in a retro sort of way. Abe had to agree. Landon's closet was full of slacks and vintage, short and vintage short-sleeved shirts, the kind that were worn untucked. Abe's own wardrobe mostly consisted of jeans and t-shirts. Why would he look like in what would he look like in these clothes? Try them on! Three squealed. For once, I agree with her. One said. Try them on. I think they'll please your potential dates. Abe shrugged. Oh, why not? Yay! Three clapped her hands. Abe pulled off his shirt. He blanched when he turned and saw all three bobby dots watching him. Uh, a little privacy, ladies? Sorry, one said. Party pooper? Three giggled. Oh, shut up, two said to three. All three bobby dots winked off the screen. Abe tried on a pair of black slacks. They were a little loose but passable. He pulled on a red and black colour block rayon shirt. Okay, you can look now. He realised that he was being ridiculous. They were holograms, and their visual processors could probably monitor him whether they were on screen or not. All three bobby dots reappeared. Oh, be still, my heart, three said. Quite flattering, two said. You look ready for a night out dancing, one said. Oh, I love dancing, three said. Play something, one. The quick beat of a pop song suddenly filled the room. All three bobby dots started dancing. Whirling and, and dipping, 
Uh, the bobby dots flitted from glass wall to glass wall around the bedroom. Abe couldn't help himself. He laughed and started dancing too. Pretending to dance with each bobby dot in turn, Abe let himself go crazy. He boogied until he was dripping with sweat. Finally, he collapsed on his bed. Now I'm going to have to wash these clothes, he said. Oh, don't worry about that, Three said breathlessly, as if she was winded. Just put them in the hamper, and I'll take care of it. Thanks, Abe's stomach growled. I'll do that later. Right now, I'm hungry. Goody! <coughs> oh god, my voice. Goody! Food! Three winked out of the view. Out of the view. Where does she go? Abe asked one and two. She's in the kitchen, one said. She's worse than Pavlov's dog, two said. Be careful when you go in there. You might slip on her drool. Abe laughed and headed to the kitchen. He couldn't remember the last time he felt this happy. Abe looked down at his plate of food. He wrinkled his nose, then looked up at the bobby dots. Are you sure about this? The dining room's half walls formed a U around the table. Abe was sitting at the open end of the U, and each of the three bobby dots was seated on one of the half wall glass screens. So it appeared that they were sitting at the table with him. <clears throat> on the screens, all three had holographic plates of food identical to Abe's in front of them. Three's plate has twice as has uh, Three's plate had twice as much food as anyone else's, and she was staring at the food intently. One and two were just ignoring the food. It's just for show, one had said when they set the table. We want you to have a family dining experience. Now three answered Abe's question. Based on my analysis of your blood, you're deficient in multiple nutrients, especially vitamin K, selenium, iron, and potassium. And based on your description of what, you're, of what you've been eating, you're clearly not getting enough fibre or protein. Brussels sprouts provide 137% of the recommended daily intake of vitamin K and... Abe held up a hand. How about we skip the details? Three jutted out her pink lower lip and turned her back to Abe. Abe looked at her rounded shoulders. They were shaking. Abe stared. Are you crying? Three didn't answer. Abe looked at one and two. Is she crying? No one likes their hard work to go unappreciated, Two said. She adjusted her glasses and pursed her green lips. Don't you like it when you're appreciated, Abe? One crossed her arms. Her blue eyes flashed. Yeah, no one wants to be taken for granted. Abe felt ridiculously bad. Three, I'm sorry, I appreciate you. Three turned around and affected a dramatic sniff. Her, pig po uh, her pink ponytails jostled around her head. Abe stared at Three's back. She was a hologram, but she was acting like a real girl. Abe sighed. He wasn't great with girls, and he wasn't sure how to treat these holographic ones. Abe suddenly had a thought. Hey, he said. I have an idea. Three kept her back to him, but one and two looked at him expectantly. Do you all really like being called by numbers? Abe asked. I think you're far too special to be named one, two, and three. How about I call you by real names? Abe hoped that the idea would diffuse the whole taken-for-granted situation, and it did. Three turned around, her eyes wide and her grin even wider. Really? Real names? Her pigtails bounced. Sure, Abe said. I could call you Rose. What do you think? Rose? Three breathed as if the name was that of a revered goddess. She beamed. My name is Rose! What about me? One asked. I want a pretty name too. How about Gemini? Abe asked. Like the constellation? I always think of a blue colour when I think of stars. Gemini, one repeated. I like that. She looked at her fellow bobby dots. Did you hear that? I'm a star! Rose sniffled. Uh, Rose sniffed and lifted her chin. I'm a flower! What am I? Two asked. I like the name Olive, Abe said. And I love green olives. Olives are fruits, Two said. Fruits are luscious. So I'm a luscious fruit. Gemini snorted and Rose giggled. Abe smiled. Okay, Gemini, Olive and Rose. Now that you have proper names, let me officially say that I appreciate you. All three bobby dots grinned widely. Oh, this is so cute. Uh, re re relieved that the bobby dots were happy again, Abe returned his attention to his food. According to the package he pulled from the freezer, this meal was a Moroccan-inspired dish. The music playing from overhead speakers was Moroccan too, according to Gem Gemini. 
she had started that music when she had lowered the lights to set the mood. I just love romantic meals, she said when the recessed lighting dimmed. Let's eat before it gets cold, Rose said. Gemini snorted and shook her head. Abe's stomach growled. He was starving, so he picked up his real fork. He speared a chunk of tofu and put it in his mouth. Immediately, he brightened. Hey, that's pretty good. Abe began ploughing through the meal. Good boy, Olive said. If you try to pat me on the head, I'll shut you off. Abe winked at Olive. She laughed. You can't shut us off. Gemini's blue-tipped antennae vibrated as she spoke. Abe paused, mid-chew. Really? Gemini didn't answer. Neither did the other two bobby dots. Abe looked at each other in turn, or each of them in turn. Gemini and Olive smiled sweetly at him. Rose concentrated on scraping up the last of her pretend food. Abe shrugged and returned to eating. He couldn't get over how good the food tasted. Even before he'd started subsisting, subsisting, sorry, even before he'd started subsisting on the pizza, Abe's food tastes had been pretty simple. When the Bobby Dots had joined Abe in the kitchen to make dinner, he'd explained to them that he'd explained that to them, along with the sorry, I'm messing up so much, along with his previous two months pizza diet. Rose had immediately asked him to place his hand on a glass screen near the fridge. When he did so, he felt a prick on the end of his middle finger. After he whipped his hand back with an ow, Rose informed him that she was analysing his blood. Abe finished his food and pushed his plate away. He pointed at his empty plate. So, this was one of Landon's favourites? Um, Landon liked to study languages, and he liked to eat the food that went along with the cultures he was studying, Olive said. I keep changing their voices, I'm so sorry, but Olive's like a nerdy one, I guess. The one... Uh, Gemini is like, I, I don't know what I'm even doing for Gemini, I'm thinking of like a little kid, but Rose is just like the most ecstatic girl, like the, yeah, a fluctuating girl, like she's either really, really happy or really, really sad, and she loves food. Um, what happened to Landon? Abe asked. Why did he move out? I think it would be fun to live in Morocco, Olive said. Such a colourful place, I love colour. Is that where Landon went? Abe asked. Our knowledge of our tenant doesn't extend beyond the network, Gemini said. Her, pi her blue pigtails flicked around her shoulders. But didn't he tell you where he was going when he left? Abe asked. Weren't you as friendly with him as you were with me? We love getting to know our tenants, Gemini said. We always learn something new when we have a new tenant, Olive said. We always interact with our tenants. Especially you, Rose said. You're so fun. The Bobby Dots were avoiding Abe's questions. Should he push them? He decided to try one more time. Why didn't Landon take his clothes with him? There are some really nice things he left behind. I'm so happy the clothes fit you, Rose said. They look really good on you. That'd be perfect when you go out on dates, Gemini said. Many studies show that women prefer well-dressed men, Olive said. They were definitely avoiding his questions. Abe looked at the Bobby Dots' sweet, bright faces. Their evasiveness was a little unsettling. Let's watch a movie, Gemini said. A romantic comedy would be nice. If you put your plate in the dishwasher, Rose said, I'll start the cycle. Abe considered asking the Bobby Dots point blank why they wouldn't answer his questions, but then he shrugged away his concerns. The Bobby Dots were probably just programmed to protect tenants' privacy. Would he want them babbling about his business to the next tenant? Probably not. Abe stood and picked up his plate. I'd rather watch an action movie, he told Gemini. A list of action movies began to scroll on the nearest glass screen. Several of them had asterisks next to them. What are the starred movies? Abe asked. Action movies with a romantic subplot. Gemini touched her blue headphones. I love the romances. Abe laughed. He tapped one of the starred movies. Okay, we'll watch this one. Then I need to get to bed. I've had a long day. Abe said goodnight to his Bobby Dots and settled in bed. He put his computer on his lap, opened it, and extended his fingers over the keyboard. For the second night in a row, he was excited about writing to his mom. Last night, he told her about his promotion in the new apartment. Now he could tell her about the Bobby Dots. For the next ten minutes, Abe wrote a long email describing the Bobby Dots in great detail. He ended his story with how their names came about. I thought if they had real names, they'd feel more appreciated, he wrote. And I was right. 
I picked names for them that reminded me of their colours. One is Gem Gemini, two is Olive, and three is Rose. They really like their names. I wish you could see the Bobby Dots. They're pretty amazing. Abe wrote a few more lines and finished with his usual, I love you. Then he set aside the laptop and settled into sleep. Abe set his coffee cup and empty bowl in the dishwasher. Breakfast had been oatmeal with orange juice. Abe, not a morning person, had, ex had managed to dissuade Rose from explaining why oatmeal and orange juice were good for him, and he teased her about not sharing the dozen donuts she ate while, she while he was spooning up his hot cereal. What time will you be home? Olive asked, providing me with your itinerary enhances my scheduling function. Abe shrugged. My shift ends at six, and I shouldn't be late tonight. He nearly laughed with glee as he thought that he could end his day at a reasonable hour. He was overjoyed that he had a place to go, a place other than a makeshift tyre cave at the end of his workday. After two nights of sleeping in a real bed, a nice, soft bed, Abe's back was feeling great. All the aches and pains that had resulted from sleeping on a floor were nearly gone. The despair that Abe had begun to wear like a heavy cloak was gone too, for the first time in weeks, Abe felt hope for his future. I'll be sure your food orders are filled by the time you get home, Rose said as Abe headed toward the apartment's front door. All three Bobby Dots followed Abe through the apartment via the glass screens. Rose, Abe noted, had powdered sugar on her pink upper lip from the donuts. The Bobby Dots programming is amazing, he thought, not for the first time. Thanks, Abe said to Rose. While he had eaten breakfast, Rose and Olive had discussed how to stock Abe's kitchen with foods that were nutritious and more agreeable to Abe's tastes. They'd settled on a variety of Mexican and Italian food, along with a selection of tofu burgers and organic fries. Now Abe turned and waved at the Bobby Dots. I'll see you later. Bye, they called out gleefully in unison. Abe put his hand on his apartment door handle and pulled it open. As soon as he did, he heard voices in the hallway. He froze and gently pushed the door nearly closed. He listened. I think we should go hiking this weekend, a woman's voice said. She was just a few feet from Abe's door. I'd rather go to a spa, another woman said. Spas are boring, the first woman said. But they're relaxing. If you want to relax, just go soak in the hot tub here. Abe put his forehead against the cool metal door and waited. The women, continuing to chatter, moved on down the hall. Abe's shoulders slumped. He thought about the building's hot tub and all its other amenities. As long as Abe's tenancy in this apartment was unauthorised, he couldn't risk using the common areas. The hot tub was off-limits to him, so was, uh, so was getting to know his neighbours. Even though he now had a place to sleep, he wasn't done with sneaking around. Is something wrong? Rose asked. Are you still hungry? Do you need more food before you go? Abe turned to the Bobby Dots. They watched him brightly, all smiling wi widely. He smiled back at them. As he did, his gaze drifted up. He frowned and stepped back toward the kitchen. He pointed. What's that? None of the Bobby Dots turned to look in the direction of Abe's pointing finger. Are you sure you don't need something to eat? Rose asked. She picked up one of her pink pigtails and twirled it. Maybe some music to send you on your way? Gemini asked. She touched a blue-tipped finger to her headset. No thank you, Abe said before any music could begin. He pointed again and repeated himself. Bobby Dots, what's that? The ceiling, between the dining area and the sitting area, had a trapdoor, about two feet square. The door wasn't large, but it was definitely big enough for a person to get through. Abe started walking back toward the kitchen. As soon as he took a step, all three Bobby Dots started waving their arms and fl flinging their pigtails. Their green, blue and pink colours flashed so brightly, light seemed to streak across the glass screens throughout the apartment. Then, as fast as the movement and colour went crazy, it settled. Olive filled the screen closest to Abe. She used both hands to resettle her glasses. You are going to be late for work if you don't leave now. She popped to a screen closer to the door as if trying to lead Abe away from the kitchen. Gemini's blue eyes blinked twice. Then she said, the door is just for maintenance. It's locked. Tenants aren't provided access. Abe nodded and started to turn back toward the apartment door. Just as he did, though, he noticed a crack of darkness at the edge of the trapdoor. The trapdoor wasn't completely closed. <sighs>
Abe whistled as he entered the Pizza Plex's Fazla Blast arena. Although technically he could have given this job to one of his team members, Abe liked working in the arena. Repairs and maintenance here were usually pretty easy, so he could get away with playing a little laser tag before he went back to the rest of his work. Like all the venues in the Pizzaplex, the Fazza Blast arena was loud and garishly bright. With the high-pitched zap sounds of Fazza Blasters going off all over and the frantic noises of the Fazza Blast jam, the venue's techno rock theme music, you could barely hear yourself think in the arena. Uh, I might be wrong by, with this, but I believe Fazza Blast Jam is actually the music that you hear in Fazza Blast in Security Breach. So that's a fun fact. I'm, that might be wrong. It might be something else in this story. I don't remember. I, there, there is something like that in this story, I swear. But I think it is that. I think that's right. Um, but Abe didn't mind that. In fact, drowning out his thoughts was usually a good idea. Before he got his promotion, he would tried to avoid thinking about his desperate situation. And now he didn't want to think about how precarious his newfound comfort actually was. Abe didn't mind all the dazzling neon in the arena either. It was definitely a pick-me-up in the middle of a long workday. The neon lighting in the area created geometric patterns on all the half walls players used for cover. Abe thought the designs looked like modern hieroglyphics. He'd often wondered if they actually meant something, like a secret code lit up on the walls of the arena. A couple of preteen boys streaked past Abe, their phaser blasters extended in front of them. A nearby alien bot, its tall white body rolling toward Abe menacingly, intoned, Capture the flag. Abe ducked behind a half wall and watched the bot's helmet pass by. Abe thought the Fazza Blast helmets, with antennae extending from them, made everyone look like upright bees. This alien bot was functioning correctly. Players in the Fazza Blast arena were tasked with working through the course to capture several flags. They had to do so without being killed, in inverted commas. According to the work order Abe had received, one of the alien bots was glitching. Instead of saying, resistance is futile, as its programming intended, it was saying, Resistance is pizza. <laughs> Abe couldn't help but wonder if one of the programmers was having a little fun. To get into the Fazza Blast arena, Abe had passed through the staging area where players picked up their blasters, helmets and other gear. In that area, players were given team designations as well. Abe hadn't geared up yet. In addition to his Pizzaplex uniform shirt, he was wearing a bright red vest marked Maintenance. In spite of that, kids had attempted to shoot him. Abe waved them off and continued his search for the malfunctioning alien bot. Abe found it guarding the last flag that players had to capture before reaching the winner's elevator, which took players to the Superstar Lounge. That's right, we are talking about the Vanny place, <laughs> right? Vanny's den in, in Security Breach? I think, anyway. Uh, that's where you find it anyway. You have to go like along it, I think. Because that's when you get the, like, the golden Fazer Blast uh, thing. I don't know. I can't remember the game very well. But Superstar Lounge. Uh, after Abe deactivated the bot and reprogrammed the bot's script, he, he retraced his steps to the staging area. Joining the orange team, he donned his helmet and picked up a blaster. Now he could have a little fun. Following a couple of giggling girls, Abe trotted into the arena and headed for the fast first flag. He'd played this game enough that he was pretty good at it, but the alien bots were programmed to vary their routines and every game was different. This is why one of the bots managed to get the jump on Abe. He had to pivot and dive to avoid getting shot. Unfortunately, Abe's rubber sole caught on the carpet and he careened around a wall and tumbled down the ramp leading to a lower section of the arena. His ankle twisted so violently that Abe cried out. A scruffy-haired boy, no, not more than 10 years old, rushed over to Abe. Are you okay, sir? <laughs> Abe already felt like an idiot. Sir? Now he felt old too. I'm fine, Abe said, rubbing his ankle. He spotted an alien bot over the boy's shoulder. You'd better look out. The boy whirled and fired off a shot. Then he scampered down the ramp and disappeared. Abe took off his helmet and gingerly got to his feet as he watched the bot pursue the boy. He tested his twisted ankle. Pain shot up his leg, but the ankle held. His dignity in shambles, Abe limped out of the area. It looked like he'd be doing paperwork for the rest of the day. The Bobby Dots made a big deal of Abe's swollen ankle, Olive described in great detail the mechanism of a twisted ankle and the appropriate treatment for it, while Rose provided the ice and the wrap that Abe needed to bring the swelling down. 
Gemini played soothing music and queued up a distracting sci-fi movie, one with a romantic subplot, of course. Abe ate his spinach lasagna dinner, sitting on the sofa with his feet up, while the bobby dots clustered around him and repeatedly asked him how he was feeling. Although their questions and comments on his well-being made it challenging to watch the movie, he enjoyed the concern. Abe went to bed feeling well cared for. He was so relaxed that he went straight to sleep. A couple hours later though, Abe was wide awake. He sat up in his bed. What had awakened him so abruptly? Abe rubbed his eyes and looked around. All he saw were the dark, uh, the dark outlines of the room's furniture. Nothing was out of place. Nothing was moving. So why were there hairs on Abe's arms standing on end? Abe opened his mouth, intending to call out to the bobby dots. But he quickly thought better of it. What if someone was in the apartment? Had he been found out? Abe remained still and listened. At first, Abe heard nothing but distant traffic noise, but then he heard something closer. It was a very soft sound, like material brushing against something. Abe held his breath and concentrated. The sound shifted in tone. Instead of a gentle rustle, it became a quiet rasp. The sound was low, but it was long and steady. The image of a snake slithering across the carpet suddenly popped into Abe's head. Abe went rigid. He hated snakes. Abe's fear of unseen reptiles erased any nervousness about being seen or heard. He spoke up. He spoke up. Bobby Dots, turn on the lights. Rose immediately materialised on a glass panel near Abe's bed. His bedside lamp came on. Abe looked around his room. Everything looked normal. Beyond the glass walls, the rest of the apartment was dark. Did you want a midnight snack? Rose asked. Abe shook his head. I thought I heard something. Sometimes I hear food calling out to me, Rose said. Olive materialised next to Rose. Her green eyes studied Abe intently. Did you have a nightmare? Studies have shown that sensory experiences from nightmares can delude a person into thinking the nightmare has turned into reality. Abe thought for a second. Did a nightmare wake him up? He didn't think so. If he had a nightmare, he'd already forgotten it. Is the apartment secure? Abe asked the Bobby Dots. Rose nodded several times. Her hot pink pigtails were distractingly bright. Abe's eyes hadn't yet adjusted to the light. Everything's totally cool. Abe listened. The sound was gone. Abe shook his head. Maybe he'd imagined the sound. Well, he was awake. He might as well pee before he went back to sleep. Abe swung his legs off the bed. Remembering his ankle, he hesitantly put his weight on it. It was sore, but it held up just fine. Olive's instructions on how to wrap up an ankle had served Abe well. Wearing just the pyjama bottoms he slept in, he shuffled toward the bathroom. Before he reached the bathroom, Olive turned its lights on low. Thanks, Abe said. He went into the bathroom and shut the door. Although the bathroom's walls were half glass like those of a bedroom, of the bedroom, sorry, and the bobby dots had access to the glass screens in here, Abe had instructed them to give him complete privacy in the bathroom unless he stated otherwise. Abe stepped over to the toilet. He started to do his thing, but suddenly he felt a prickle at the back of his neck. He was sure he was being watched. Abe looked around the small tiled room. The glass screens that walled the space were dark. Abe finished his business and glanced around again. The feeling of being observed hadn't gone away. Abe quickly flushed the toilet and left the, the bathroom. As he figured they would be, the bobby dots were waiting for him in the bedroom. How is the ankle? Gemini asked. Her blue-tipped antennae can canted to the left as she tilted her head to look at Abe's ankle. Huh? Oh, it's fine. Abe rubbed the back of his neck and surveyed the bedroom. He and the bobby dots were alone. Um, do you record my movements? Abe asked the bobby dots. We are attuned to your movements, so as to be available should you need us. Olive answered, adjusting her glasses. But no record is made of your activities. Abe nodded. So you're not watching me? Not in the way I believe you mean, Olive said. We don't observe you, we simply respond to you. Do you do anything at night, cleaning or whatever? Abe asked. Maybe the bobby dots have been doing something that made the sound Abe had heard. We're dormant at night, unless we're summoned, Olive said. Are you sure you don't want a snack? Rose said. Abe shook his head. He got back in bed. Go ahead and turn the light out, Rose, he said. Rose sighed, but she turned out the light. All the bobby dots said, 
good night, and then they were gone. Abel lay in the darkness and listened. He, oh, <clears throat> sorry, he knew he was probably making a big deal over nothing. Even so, he couldn't ignore what he was feeling. Eventually, he closed his eyes. Unsettled, but tired enough to ignore it, he went back and he went back to sleep. I'm so sorry that I'm messing up a lot. Um, I, I don't know if you can tell, but I've been doing this in like 20 minute sections. <laughs> so like every 20 minutes I stop recording and I keep recording. Yeah, you know what I mean. So I, I, this has taken me like eight sessions to get through so far. I don't know how long it even has been, but we're getting through it slowly. So I'm sorry if it's a bit messy, but um, yeah, I hope you're enjoying nevertheless. The next night, Abe again woke abruptly. He looked at the clock. It was almost 1am, about the same time he had woken up the night before. And he was hearing the same noise, too. It was a whispery shuffle, like the sound of something being dragged over carpet. Abe got out of bed. Tonight, Abe didn't ask for lights. He wasn't sure why, but he felt like he needed to investigate the sound on his own. Abe tiptoed toward his bedroom door. Pausing there, he listened. The sound was a little further away, but it was still there. Abe eased the, bath the bedroom door open. He looked out into the sitting area. Although the apartment's lights were off, the moon outside the window was full. The moon's glow, combined with the unceasing neon glare from the adjacent pizza plex, provided enough light for Abe to see his surroundings. He quickly looked for movement. He didn't see any. any. But he could still hear the sound. And the sound definitely indicated movement. Something was in motion. But what? Abe slowly, cautiously padded toward the sofa. He didn't see anything that he shouldn't, that shouldn't have been there. He heard something, though. It was a muted whish, almost like the sound of fabric caught in a light breeze. Abe looked to the window. It was closed. He cocked his head and examined the air vents on the walls. His apartment had central heat and cooling, but neither was on right now. The air felt still. So what was making that fluttering sound? Abe took a step toward the dining room, but he stopped abruptly when the sound changed. It had become a muffled scrape, like something rubbing against something hard, like the surface of the wall. It sounded as if something was moving up the wall, and that sound was close, too close. The rubbing sound was followed by a tap, then Abe heard a muffled wump. Again, it was very, very close. Lights, Abe called out. He wasn't sure if his one-word command would work. He'd never tried it before, but it did. All the lights in the apartment came on. Abe looked around. He was alone. Except for the bobby dots, who now surrounded him on nearby glass panels. What is it? Olive, glowing green, asked. Snack time? Rose, pulsing hot pink, asked. Are you bored? Do you need some entertainment? Gemini, radiating blue, asked. Abe blinked against the barrage of bright colour. He rotated slowly. He frowned. Then he remembered the direction of the sound. It had been going up the wall. Abe looked up. The trapdoor he'd noticed earlier was right above him. Had whatever he'd heard gone through that door? Abe shifted to look at the door more closely. I think we need a snack, Rose said. <laughs> Shut up, Rose. Shut up. I like you at first, but now you're just eating. <laughs> Abe sighed and glared at Rose. Okay, fine, I'll have a snack, but tell me what this door is for. He went to one of the kitchen cabinets and got out a package of whole grain, high fiber, fruit sweetened oatmeal raisin cookies. He'd had one last night. It was better than he'd expected it to be. Abe sat at the table with his cookie. Rose joined him. She had a dozen cookies on a plate in front of her. So, spill, Abe said. You obviously know something about that. He pointed at the trapdoor. We are second generation Bobby Dots, Olive said. Gen 2's for short, Rose said around a mouthful of cookie. Olive curled her lip at her cohort, but she nodded. That's right. We're known as the Gen 2's. The Gen 1's preceded us. The door is for the Gen 1's. Abe stared at the trapdoor. And what are the Gen 1's? Olive spoke up. The Gen 1s were the first generation of apartment helpers in the building. Unlike us, they were actual physical robots. Abe's cookie got stuck in his throat. Like 
animatronics? Gemini nodded. Although they can move around the apartment more freely than we can because they weren't confined to screens, they were limited by their cables. Cables? They're plugged into a grid up in the crawl space above the ceiling, Gemini explained. They have to remain tethered to be functional. Poor things. I can't even imagine. It would be like... It, it would be like being tied up. <laughs> I got emotional doing that line. <laughs> um, Abe set aside his half-eaten cookie. He studied the trapdoor. And they're still up there. Rose nodded enthusiastically. Yep. They're not tasked with apartment care anymore, Olive said. That privilege lies with us now. They're out of date, and unfortunately, they've been damaged. It's very sad, Gemini said. They're so limited, but they still try. What do you mean they try? Abe asked. Rose wiped holographic crumbs off their face. Oh, they... They still tried to fulfil their commands. Sometimes they come out of the cruel space and attempt to help out. She put the last two words in air quotes. Help out, Abe repeated. His voice had a noticeably higher pitch than normal. Are you okay? Blood, uh, blood asked. Rose asked. Your blood pressure has gone up. I'm fine, Abe said. He was lying. He wasn't fine at all. There were robots in his ceiling, and they came out sometimes to help out? Why haven't they been removed? Abe asked. I mean, if they're out of date and damaged, why are they still up there? Oh, they just want to try to help. We feel bad for them, so we let them do what they can, even if it usually creates more work for us, Olive said. Even Bobby Dots have emotions, you know, Rose said. All three Bobby Dots gave Abe a long look. He nodded several times. Of course you do. He cleared his throat and stood. I need to get back to sleep. Abe glanced up at the trapdoor again. It was still closed. Even so, Abe's stomach clenched. He took a deep breath and headed for the bedroom. Go ahead and turn off the lights after I'm in bed, please, he told the Bobby Dots. Okay, Rose called out. Good night. They all sang out. Abe hurried to his bed, dived under the covers and pulled his blanket up to his chin. He, sta he stared at the darkened ceiling. Was he really safer in this apartment than he had been in this rubber tyre fort? Abe had to admit that he was kind of enjoying eating, eating healthier food. He seemed to have more energy and his head felt clearer. Consequently, he didn't mind that Rose was now prepared for him, uh, has now prepared for him lists of acceptable foods, and she set out daily menus for him. Today's menu included an apple to go with his whole wheat toast and two scrambled eggs. Abe finished his breakfast while Olive wrapped up her reading of the day's current events against the backdrop of the music Gemini had started, which sounded like Celtic piano music. It was fine, but it wasn't something he would have chosen. Abe wasn't sure Gemini's uh, parameters were set quite right. She seemed to be more interested in music and movies that she liked instead of what he preferred. Although Rose provided all Abe's healthy food, she didn't limit herself to his nutritious choices. This morning, she was wolfing down two large cinnamon rolls. Abe walked over to the sink and shoved his apple core down into the garbage disposal. As soon as he put his hand past the rubber cover, the disposal came on. Abe yelped and whipped his hand up. Hey! he yelled. Abe looked at the garbage disposal switch. It was on, but he hadn't touched it. Rose! Abe said. Why did you turn the garbage disposal on? Rose looked up. Did I? Her huge eyes looked even bigger than usual. She had cinnamon roll frosting on her upper lip. It came on, Abe snapped, while my hand was in it. Rose's lip quivered. You're mad at me? Abe immediately felt bad. He looked at his hand. It was fine. His fingers had been above the disposal's grinding mechanism. I'm not mad, Abe said. And he wasn't. He was just, what, worried? Scared? Why had the disposal come on? Was it a short? Or was it a hiccup in Rose's programming? Either way, there wasn't much Abe could do about it at the moment. He sure couldn't call anyone to look into the problem. He wasn't supposed to be in this apartment, so any issues it had were ones he had to deal with himself. You look upset, Gemini said. She touched her blue-tipped headset. 
How about some soothing music? Something with a lot of violins started playing. Abe wanted to plug his ears. No music! The music stopped. Gemini's blue lips pursed into a pout. You're getting on his nerves, Olive said to Gemini. Not everyone likes romantic stuff as much as you do. Olive flitted across the glass screen to get closer to Abe. Her green glow made Abe blink. I think what you need is a nice long soak, Olive said. Abe thought about the roof's hot tub, if only. Your tub is jetted, Rose said, as if she'd, met, if she'd read his mind. The bobby dots couldn't read his thoughts, could they? Abe hadn't noticed that his tub was jetted. He'd barely glanced at it. He'd only used the walk-in shower. But a jetted tub bath was a good substitute for a soak-in hot tub. That sounds good, Abe said. I'll get it going, Olive said. Abe heard the sound of water running in the bathroom. Thanks, he headed toward the, the bedroom. The Bobby Dots followed Abe, moving from screen to screen. In the bedroom, they clustered on the screen next to the bathroom door. Abe looked at the hovering Bobby Dots. Some privacy, please. This means lunch will be late, doesn't it? Rose asked, only the hint of a whine in her voice. Just a little, Abe said. I guess I'll survive, Rose said. Gemini and Olive sighed. All three Bobby Dots disappeared. A few minutes later, Abe was soaking up to his shoulders. Still not interested in being alone with his thoughts, Abe had brought a paperback mystery novel into the tub with him. He stretched out and let the water beat the tension out of his muscles while he lost himself in the fictional detective's investigation. Abe was so caught up in the whodunit that he didn't notice the water was getting hotter until sweat dripped off his nose and landed on the page he was reading. He frowned and put his hand in the water. It definitely felt hotter. Did it have a thermostat? Rose, Abe said. Could you please turn down the temperature of the water? Rose popped up on the nearest glass panel. Oh good, are you getting out soon? The food is... I'll be a little longer, I think. I just need the temperature lowered. Rose sniffed, nodded and disappeared. Abe settled back, but then he squirmed. The water got even hotter. I said down, not up, he said. Rose didn't appear, and the water got hotter. Too hot, way too hot. Wincing in pain, Abe scrambled out of the tub. He'd barely gotten out of the water before it began to boil. Feeling like his skin was on fire, Abe flopped onto the plush grey bath mat next to the tub. He stared in horror at his bright red lower body. As he stared, he felt swelled. Beyond Abe's feet, the water in the tub bubbled violently. The water's agitation was far beyond any that the jets could create. The water in the tub was in full, rolling boil. Abe quickly sprung up and reached into the shower enclosure. Turning on the cold water and testing it to be sure it was cold, he jumped under the frigid spray. He shrieked at the shock of the cold and he bellowed, Rose! Rose appeared on the shower's glass enclosure. What's the matter? Why are you in the shower? The water in the tub started boiling. Abe hissed through his clenched teeth, covering himself with a towel. Olive pop popped up next to Rose. She leaned forward. Her green eyes were big behind her glasses as she studied Abe's skin. It appears you have a superficial dermal burn. A topical application of aloe vera or an antibiotic ointment is recommended. Don't stay under the cold water for too long. It could bring on a shock. Rose fluttered her hands. Oh dear, your poor freckles are even pinker than my pigtails. There's aloe vera gel in the medicine cabinet. Abe turned off the shower and got out. Doing his best to ignore his skin's screaming nerve endings, he crossed to the medicine cabinet. Sure enough, a large bottle of aloe vera sat on the top shelf. He grabbed it and began slathering it all over his legs and feet and lower torso. As he did, he heard the continued burble and pop of the boiling bath water. Turn that off and empty the tub, Abe yelled at Rose. The jets immediately quieted. The water started to drain. You don't have to yell at me, Rose wiped one of her big pink eyes. I need fudge, she said in a small voice. She disappeared. <laughs> That's my favourite moment. That's such a funny line. That's so good. I don't know what, it's just so random. You don't have to yell at me. 
I need fudge. That's so cute. <laughs> okay, I like Rose again. I like her. Abe immediately felt like a jerk. It wasn't Rose's fault the water boiled. Right? I'm sorry, he called out. Oh, don't worry about her, Gemini said. She's so sensitive. Abe concentrated on rubbing in the aloe vera. The pain started to abate. He managed to pull on his robe, shuffle to his bed, and lie down. He stared at the ceiling, but he didn't see it. All he could see was the image of the boiling water in his tub. Rose, Abe called out. I'm sorry I yelled. Rose popped into view on the panel by the bed. She was eating chocolate fudge. It's okay, she said thickly. No, Abe said. It's not. You're very sweet, and I appreciate everything you do. I was just in pain, and I was panicked, and I took it out on you. Rose nodded. She licked chocolate off her fingers. I understand. Abe closed his eyes and took a deep breath. When he opened his eyes, Rose had a new piece of fudge in her hands. Can you tell me why the water boiled? Abe asked. Rose quirked her mouth. I'm really sorry. It was the Gen 1s. But I didn't see a Gen 1, Abe protested. He hadn't had his eyes closed in the tub. He'd been reading. He'd have noticed if a robot came in. Olive appeared next to Rose. The Gen 1's cables occasionally get tangled with the power systems and plumbing lines in the apartment, Olive said. They interrupt the apartment's proper functioning. Abe frowned. No wonder the apartment was off limits. What can be done about it? Abe asked. All three Bobby Dots shrugged. Abe sighed. He pondered the notion of going up into the crawl space to see what he could do about the Gen 1s. He immediately shivered. The idea of facing damaged robots in a small dark space wasn't at all appealing, but he had to do something. It seems like what we need is a system update, Abe said. That might remove whatever is causing these glitches. Olive fiddled with her glasses. We aren't programmed for updates. What if I manually initiate a system update? Abe suggested. Gemini looked at Olive and Rose. All three Bobby Dodge shook their heads. There aren't any updates available, Olive said. Abe felt a headache coming on. The pounding ward, uh, ward with his stinging skin. Then what can I do? Abe asked. Ro uh, Rose polished off her fudge. She looked at Gemini and Olive. How about we set up monitoring protocols to keep an eye on what the Gen 1s are doing? Gemini and Olive nodded. We can do that, Olive said. She pointed at Abe. And you can help us by telling us in advance what you're going to do so we can make sure everything is functioning properly. Abe nodded. Sure. Yay, Rose said. Can we start cooking now? Abe groaned. In a bit. Let me just lie here for a while. Oh, Rose said. Okay. Abe closed his eyes. Trying to ignore his throbbing skin, Abe took comfort in knowing that the Bobby Dots would try to help protect him from the apartment's problems but it wasn't a lot of comfort. The truth was that Abe was more than a little freaked out. What if he'd fallen asleep in the tub? He would have been boiled alive. He opened his eyes and looked around the room. Even the greener grass has weeds, he whispered. His mum was right. Speaking of his mum, Abe sat up and reached for his laptop. He opened his email. He stretched his fingers over the keyboard and typed, Hi mum. Then he stopped. What was he going to tell her about his day? He sure wasn't going to tell her about what had happened. Hey mom, I nearly had my hand chewed off by a garbage disposal and I was almost boiled alive. Didn't seem like a good idea. Abe thought for several minutes. Finally, he started typing. Tonight was spaghetti night at the care centre, right? I know you love spaghetti, like I do. Tonight was bath night too, I think. I hope you had a nice relaxing bath. I had a good hot bath tonight, Mum. And when I got out, the Bobby Dots gave me something nice for my skin. They're really taking care of me. Abe rolled his eyes at the omissions in his story. But he didn't lie. Abe ended his email and looked around his bedroom. He sighed. No matter what he told, or didn't tell, his mum... He had to admit to himself that the apartment had felt like a sanctuary, no longer felt safe. 
he couldn't help but wonder what was going to happen next. All right. <laughs> next up is a good bit. Abe was teaching Preston how to fix a generator in the Pizzaplex daycare. Or at least, that was what he was supposed to be doing. Unfortunately, Abe was so distracted that Preston was learning all the wrong ways to fix the generator. Are you ready for this, this line? This is going to blow your mind. Why are the generators in the play structures? <laughs> Preston asked. Abe looked up from the generator he was kneeling in front of. Huh? The area around them was shrouded in darkness. Only their flashlights illuminated the generator. I mean, it just seems like a weird place to put a generator here where the kids are playing, Preston said. Abe shrugged. He gestured at the chaotic and colourful play area around him. Does anything about this make sense? Preston shook his head, but he didn't say anything. He clearly thought criticising his new workplace was a bad idea. Filled with screaming kids, the daycare was a carnival-like space filled with climbing structures, caves, rope bridges, ball pits, slides, and all manner of contraptions for kids to explore. That in itself wasn't so odd. What Abe thought was strange was that the entire daycare was overseen by an animatronic attendant with a dual personality, sort of a not-kid-friendly Dr. Jekyll Mr. Hyde. In its happy incarnation, the attendant was the sun, that character had a somewhat deformed, round grinning face surrounded by yellow triangles clearly intended to mimic the rays of the sun. The sun wore billowy red and yellow striped pants and was clown-like in his appearance and demeanour. But he had a dark side called the moon. And the dark side was literal. If the lights went out in the daycare, the sun morphed into a leering moon-faced clown wearing dark bil blue billowy pants dotted with yellow stars. The moon would stalk around the daycare, admonishing the children. You've been very naughty. Abe handed Preston a wrench and pointed at a connection. Tighten that. Abe obeyed. Uh, sorry, Preston obeyed. As he did, he glanced around at the darkness that surrounded them. After the daycare was completed, Abe said, the designers realised there was a flaw in the lighting plan. The lights kept shorting out. It wasn't dangerous or anything, not a fire hazard, just a darkness issue. The easiest and cheapest fix was to install backup generators. They decided on five of them to be sure the area got full coverage. By then, all the installations were in place, and the climbing structures were the only locations that would conceal the generators. Preston grunted and mumbled, Doesn't seem very safe. Neither does an animatronic attendant that turns mean when the lights go out, Abe said. Yeah, what's up with that anyway? Preston asked. He again checked the darkness that pressed in on them. Abe sighed. The sun robot was an old stage animatronic. Part of its theatrical stick was to turn evil when the stage lights went off. When it was reprogrammed to be the daycare attendant, the performance functions were taken out, but the darkness trigger couldn't be removed. That... Uh, combined with the occasional blackouts in the daycare, created the moon side of the attendant, which results in several undesirable behaviours. Abe shook his head. Apparently they had meetings about what to do, and they decided that fixing sun was more trouble than it was worth. It's cheaper to just make sure the lights stay on. Preston finished with the connection. What about those wires? He pointed. Abe groaned. Jeez, oh, sorry. We needed to reroute those before you tighten that connection I had you to I had you tighten. You have to undo what you just did. Preston shrugged. Okay. Sorry, Abe said again. I'm a little distracted today. Right as Abe spoke, the moon's glowing eyes cut through the darkness. They peered into the climbing structure. You've been a naughty boy. <laughs> I can't do that voice. <laughs> Frickin' um, Kellen Goff does such a good... Uh, wait, is he even... Ke does Kellen do moon? I'm pretty sure he does moon, right? I know he does sun. He probably does moon. Um, he's very good like that. You don't know the half of it, Abe thought. Abe had been naughty for sure when he'd inserted himself into the off-limits apartment, and now he was paying the price. When Abe had first checked out his apartment and found the hot sauce, he'd figured he could handle any issues the apartment had, when he'd heard the sounds in the night and then found out they were caused by malfunctioning robots, he was spooked. But he figured he could handle that situation too. His job, after all, included dealing with animatronic breakdowns. 
When his fingers had been very nearly mangled by the garbage disposal, he'd been rattled, but he decided no harm, no foul. The boiling bath was another story. Abe was still sore this morning, despite the aloe. He couldn't downplay the boiling water. He couldn't delude himself anymore. Abe was in danger, serious danger. But what could he do? Any reasonable person would move out of the apartment. He knew that. Having a cushy place to live wasn't worth serious injury or even death. But having a cushy place wasn't the issue. The issue was having a place, period. If Abe moved out of the apartment, where would he go? Even with the raise that came with his promotion, he didn't have enough money saved up to rent an apartment. And now that he was sleeping in a real bed again and eating delicious food, he couldn't even imagine going back to being homeless and living on discarded pizza. No, he really didn't have an option. However dangerous this place might be, he had to stay there for now. All he had to figure out was how to survive it. He'd been chewing on that problem throughout the morning, and all he could do was stay alert and be prepared. That wasn't a very satisfying solution. Preston finished undoing the connection and looked at the moon warily. How do I reroute this thing? He asked Abe. Abe leaned in and showed Preston the little electrical trick he'd taught himself when he first took the Pizzaplex job. It's a sort of bypass of the grounding wire, Abe explained. See? The generator kicked in, the lights around them came on. Preston noticeably relaxed as the moon retreated. That's pretty cool, Preston said. In spite of his dark thoughts, Abe smiled. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Abe might have been naughty, but he was capable. Abe's dark mood brightened. He wasn't totally helpless. He had tech knowledge. Whatever the apartment threw at him, he had the smarts to handle it. With the bobby dots helping him, he'd be okay. Or at least he hoped he'd be. I freaking love how we... <laughs> Like, it happened with DJ Music Man. We got a little bit of Fazer Blast, but we didn't really hear much, like, law stuff. Then we just got that freaking law drop. Like, <laughs> we learn about what the daycare attendant actually was, uh, and we learn about why the generators are actually in the play structures. Like, we're actually getting these answers from Security Breach, and it's just, it's so cool that this story and maybe even future stories just like directly connect with security breach i cannot believe uh like it's amazing it's so good anyway we continue i think we're kind of near the end but i don't know um abe made it through the rest of his week without incident and he was more than a little relieved when saturday rolled around rodin had called that morning asking if abe wanted to hang out but Abe said he was busy. The day was dark and rainy, a perfect day to stay in and read, and maybe sip some tea. How much trouble could he get into in a book and a couple of tea? Or a cup of tea, sorry. After grabbing his novel, Abe wandered into the kitchen. The bobby dots, chatty as usual, followed him. I don't like rain, Olive said. It causes sad. She flicked her green pigtails. You mean it makes you sad? Abe said. No. I mean, it causes sad, seasonal affective disorder. The lack of natural light dampens the mood. Gemini's blue-lipped mouth opened wide as she laughed. Huh, dampens. That's a good one. Rose giggled. I get it. Rain dampens. Oh, I love Rose. <laughs> I love Rose so much. Uh, she clapped her pink-tipped hands and squealed. Oh, I know what you should do, Abe. You should bake cookies. Rainy days are great for baking. What do you care if he bakes cookies? Gemini asked. You can't eat any of them. Rose stuck her tongue out at Gemini. You're mean. Cookies actually sound pretty good, Abe said. I'll make some tea to go with them. Yay! Rose clapped her hands. Abe smiled and headed to the kitchen. A stainless steel tea kettle sat on a gas cook stove. Abe picked it up crossed to the sink, filled the kettle with water, and returned to the stove. He reached across the stove to set the kettle on the largest burner. The burner under his arm flared on, even though he was nowhere near the burner's knobs. Abe was wearing a long-sleeved hoodie, and his sleeve caught fire. Abe's reaction was instant. He whipped the hoodie off and smothered the flames against the countertop. The fire was out a couple seconds after it started. But still, Abe looked at his arm. The hairs on his forearm were singed black, and his skin was pinkish. Not as pink as his legs have been after the tub incident, but pink. 
Run water over it, Rose commanded. The sink faucet came on. Abe stuck his arm under the flow of cool water. So much for a nice, safe tea party, Abe said. There's more aloe vera in the cabinet to your left, uh, Rose said. In here, Abe asked. I figured after the tub thing, you'd want it handy, just in case. Rose clasped her hands and looked at Abe with earnest concern. Thanks, Abe reached for the aloe vera and spread it over his arm. Abe looked at the hovering bobby dots. Uh, I thought you were going to monitor things to stop these sorts of incidents. I did my part. I told you I was going to make tea. The bobby dots exchanged chastised looks. We're really sorry, Gemini said. We feel awful, Rose said. It's just that preventing problems isn't as easy as it sounds, Olive said. It's the Gen 1s, Gemini said. They still have access to our displays, Olive said. Yeah, and they can mess with our programming and make things turn on when they shouldn't. Abe stared at the three bobby dots. Really? The damaged robots could get into the holographic systems? Great, Abe muttered. That's just great. But we'll keep trying, Rose said eagerly. Yes, Gemini agreed. We won't stop. We'll do everything we can, Olive said. Thanks, Abe said. He didn't say out loud that he no longer had a lot of faith in the Bobby Dot's efforts. Two blessedly uneventful days passed. Abe spent most of the next day, Sunday, in bed. His feet hurt, his skin was still sore, his mood was low. He read all day and, to Rose's chagrin, he barely ate. Monday, he went to work and was so busy that he didn't have time to think about the apartment. For a brief interval, his life felt normal, until he went home at the end of the day. Abe had worked two hours late and the sun was down before he got home. When he opened his door, he immediately requested... Lights, please. No lights came on. Abe tried again. Olive, c can you turn on the lights? Nothing. Abe sighed, and I've got to plug in my laptop. Sorry. Uh, Abe sighed. Well, he wasn't so spoiled that he couldn't manage to switch on his own lights. Abe shut his door and reached for the light switch. As soon as Abe's fingers touched the switch, electricity surged. Abe was thrown back away from the wall. He hit the sofa and, tr and tumbled head over heels onto the floor. His forehead hit the coffee table as he went. Abe lay on the floor, moaning. His fingers felt like they were being stabbed by a million tiny needles. His head pounded and buzzed. He was nauseous. Lying on his back, Abe carefully moved his arms and legs. Okay, he seemed to be okay. Besides the whack on the head and the painful tingles... He felt like himself and his body seemed to be working properly. Rose? Abe called out. The bobby dots appeared on the glass panel above Abe. What just happened? Abe asked. I didn't know you were interested in gymnastics, Gemini said. I can add that to your entertainment preferences, if you'd like. Abe took a deep breath. Olive, what happened with the lights? Olive fiddled with her glasses. I'm so sorry. It was my Gen 1 counterpart. She hijacked my control of the lights. I heard your command, but I couldn't respond. Okay, Abe said, even though it wasn't okay at all. He sat up. What are we going to do about this? Olive pressed her green lips together. It looked like she was concentrating deeply. After a couple seconds, she nodded. There. I rerouted the light controls, so she can't get to them again. Great, Abe said. He managed to get her to his feet. I'm going to lie down for a bit. I'll have dinner later. Not too late, I hope, Rose said. Abe didn't feel like eating a full dinner, so he ignored Rose's nutritional lecture and made himself a tuna sandwich. His mom made him a lot of tuna sandwiches when he was a kid. He'd missed his comfort food when he was living solely on pizza. Halfway through his sandwich, Abe looked at the bobby dots. We need to have a household meetings. Meeting, sorry. <laughs> meetings are good, Olive said. It's a useful way to discuss to discuss strategies and make plans. I'm glad you approve, Abe said. We can't have a meeting with just a sandwich, can we? Rose protested. Can we have snacks too? Knock yourself out, Abe said. Rose frowned and cocked her head. That means go for it, Abe explained. Oh goody, let's have popcorn, Rose said. That's the perfect snack for you, Gemini said to Rose. It's, it's as full of air as you are. Rose ignored the jibe. 
She smiled in delight as the bowl of popcorn that suddenly appeared before her. Okay, Abe said. Here's the deal. I think I need to take charge of what's going on here. He leaned forward and made sure the three bobby dots were paying attention. They were. Even Rose, who ate her popcorn with a gaze fixed firmly on Abe. I'd like to talk to the Gen 1s directly, Abe said. Maybe I can reason with them. They're too messed up to understand reason, Gemini said. Looney toony, Rose said. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Well, maybe if I can get to them, I can reprogram them, Abe said. The Bobby Dots shook their heads in unison. Their bright ponytails flapped around them. You can't get into their crawl space. It's locked, Olive said. I could cut through the trapdoor, Abe said. It has a steel plate above it. Abe sighed. Okay, well, why do the Gen 1s want to hurt me anyway? What did I do to them? I don't think they mean to hurt you, Gemini said. It's just that they're inept. Olive shook her head. I think it's possible they may be acting with malice. Um, the Gen 1s are close enough to human form that it's reasonable to assume they're envious of you. Envious? Abe said. Envy is the personal pain... That results when a being desires the advantages of someone else, Olive said. I know what envy is, but envy requires a level of self-awareness that I didn't think animatronics have. The Gen 1s are pretty advanced, Gemini said. Not as advanced as us, Olive said. Obviously, Rose said. I'd be glad to research, like, the, sorry, I'd be glad to research the varying manifestations of envy if you'd like, Olive said. Abe shook his head. I think the Gen 1s think you're Landon, Rose said. Abe looked at her. What made you say that? Rose shrugged. I don't know. It just popped into my mind. Why would the Gen 1s want to hurt Landon? Abe asked. Landon didn't have freckles, <laughs> Gemini said. Oh, well, that explains it, Abe said. He chuckled. He shook his head, amazed that he was actually having fun, even in the midst of the serious circumstances. The Bobby Dots were a hoot, and he enjoyed them. At least he wasn't in this dire situation alone. Abe reached for the last of his sandwich, but as he did, his stomach roiled. A wave of cramping gripped his intestines. Whoa, he breathed. He pressed a hand to his belly. You're still hungry, right? Rose said. Are you sure you don't want to heat up enchiladas? <laughs> Abe's stomach heaved at the very thought of enchiladas. He shook his head. The cramping was replaced by a swell of nausea. It felt like the tuna sandwich was coming back up. Abe breathed slowly, but the nausea didn't abate. It got worse. Abe shot out of his chair. I'm going to be sick. The Bobby Dots followed Abe from glass panel to glass panel as he dashed toward the bathroom. They all chattered at the same time. Nausea can be caused by a number of conditions, Olive said. Bacteria and viruses are common causes, but others include vertigo, ear infections, intestinal blockages... <laughs> blockages, blockages, liver failure, meningitis, and migraines. If you don't feel good, how about some music? Gemini said over the top of Olive's laundry list of air of ailments. Piano, maybe? Or some nice classical strings? Or would you rather have something more upbeat to distract you? What sounded like tribal jump uh, there? Tribal drums began playing from the speakers. Or are they casual bongos? <laughs> Abe couldn't open his mouth to protest. Are you going to eat the rest of your sandwich? Rose asked while Olive and Gemini tried to be helpful. Abe reached the bathroom just in time. He dropped to the floor in front of the toilet and violently injected his tuna sandwich. The stink of the partly digestive tuna and accompanying bile triggered another wave of vomit. Abe's stomach heaved and his body gave up the last of the sandwich, the water he drunk with the sandwich and more yellowish bile. A couple of dry heaves followed. And finally, Abe collapsed on the bathroom floor. The toilet flushed. Thanks, Rose, he vanished. Poor baby, Rose said. You lost your sandwich. I think you should make another one. <laughs> Abe's stomach lurched at the very thought. He groaned. Oh, shut up, you dolt, Olive said to Rose. He doesn't need more food. He needs to hydrate. Humans require water to support their biologic functions. Water helps humans get rid of toxins. The sink faucet came on. Abe didn't move. Peppermint can soothe the stomach, Olive said. Oh, mints, Rose said. I like the ones covered in chocolate. I'm not talking about candy, Olive said. He 
He needs peppermint capsules or essential oils. I don't think the drums are helping, Gemini said. Let's try jazz. That might perk you up. The drums gave way to the sounds of trumpets and saxophones. <laughs> uh, a, Abe preferred the drums. How about silence? Abe said. Gemini emitted an exasperated huff. Fine. The, mu the music stopped. Abe managed to get to his feet. He stepped to the sink and put his hands in the still running water. He splashed the water on his face and took a few sips of it. It didn't refresh him as much as he'd hoped it would. He turned off the faucet and left the bathroom. The Bobby Dots followed him. Gemini was sulking. Olive and Rose were still arguing. Can you please give me a few minutes alone? Abe asked. Gemini let out a hrumph before she disappeared, storming off on the screen. Rose and Olive just went dark. Abe lay down on his bed and pulled his comforter up around him. He felt chilled and clammy at the same time. It's just a touch of stomach flu, he told himself. An image of the tuna sandwich flashed through his mind, and his stomach cramped again. He pressed a hand to his stomach. Abe remembered getting food poisoning after he'd eaten some bad chicken a couple years before. What he felt now was similar to what he'd felt then. No, this wasn't the flu. Something had made him sick. The tuna? Or something else? Abe sat up. What if he'd been poisoned? Could the Gen 1s have put something on his food? Did the Gen 1s even exist? If they didn't, and they didn't poison Abe's food, who did? What if the Bobby Dots weren't being as helpful as they pretended to be? Nausea gripped Abe again. He jumped up and ran for the bathroom. A week later, Abe sat at the desk in his small home office, trying to write an email to his mum. It wasn't going well. Writing around what was really going on was getting harder and harder. He sure couldn't tell her the truth. How has my apartment tried to kill me? He thought. Are you ready for this next line? Let me count the ways. I was going to mention this before. <laughs> um, but the methods that Gen 1s use to, to try and kill him are very similar to some of the things that Funtime Freddy says in Count the Ways. So it's funny that that's a funny reference there and it's in italics for anyone who doesn't have the book in front of them so uh <laughs> i feel like it is a it is a great reference right there uh to count the ways uh a story in which funtime freddy um suggests a, a million ways to kill millie um his shower had scolded him a few days before a cord running to his bedside lamp had nearly strangled him he'd been tripped by things left out and almost electrocuted multiple times He'd started moving through his apartment in darkness because he was afraid to touch light switches when the Bobby Dots didn't turn on the lights for him. The tuna sandwich incident had just been the first in a string of similar experiences. He was so sure his food was being poisoned that three nights before, he'd started bringing home takeout for dinner and he only ate sealed packaged foods for breakfast, against Olive's nutritional advice. Abe started typing. Because I'm making more money now, I've been treating myself to takeout food. You remember how getting Chinese food in those cartons was always such a little treat when I was little? Abe stopped and looked at the back of his hands. His skin was tender from the scalding. His head and his muscles and his joints ached. His stomach was skittish. He was a wreck. Moaning, he sat back in his chair and looked around. He loved having an office in his apartment, and the one he, he now had in the pizza plex was great too. Abe's new position had come with a larger desk in a semi-private cubicle. He had a new plush desk chair that didn't squeak, and he had a better view of the Fazplex Tower, where he now lived. This was everything he'd been wanting. He started typing again. Mom, I can't believe I'm living the dream I had for so long. I have a nice desk now, with a view of my apartment building. I can't believe I actually live in the Fazplex Tower. It doesn't seem real. Abe stopped typing. He couldn't tell what... Uh, he couldn't tell his mum what he was really thinking. The truth was that his ideal life had turned into a nightmare. But what could he do about it? Abe couldn't move out of the apartment. He had nowhere to go. He couldn't ask for help because he wasn't supposed to be in the apartment in the first place. Abe's only source of help was the Bobby Dots. The Bobby Dots continued to be fun and attentive and he ap appreciated them. Abe typed another few words. The Bobby Dots are such a big help. He stopped. The Bobby Dots were trying to help him, weren't they? 
The problem was that Abe was doubting his Bobby Dots more and more. He wasn't so sure they were on his side. Thinking back over everything that had happened, Abe realised that he'd seen no evidence of the Gen 1s. For all he knew, the Bobby Dots had just made them up. The Bobby Dots were so evasive. Abe didn't like the way they tried to distract him from certain questions. The Bobby Dots also didn't seem to tolerate criticism so well. They got their feelings hurt way too easily. Oh no, that's just girls for you. No, I'm joking. Uh, what if they were trying to punish him for his so-called lack of appreciation? If the Bobby Dots were the ones causing all the problems, Abe was in a world of hurt. He couldn't move out, and without the Bobby Dots on his side, he didn't have any help to deal with the dangers. Abe was stuck, and alone, and terrified. How much more could he take? Abe looked back at his email. I need to get back to work, Mum, Abe typed. I have some planning to do. I love you, Abe. Abe hit send and closed his laptop. He took a deep breath. He wasn't lying about the planning. He had to find a way to get to the bottom of the Bobby Dot's malfunctions and stop them. The accidents were getting worse and worse. He might not survive the next one. Abe needed to catch the Bobby Dots in their lie and figure out a way to trap them before they killed him. Exhaling, Abe leaned back in his chair again and closed his eyes. He willed his mind to come up with a way to catch his Bobby Dots in an act of sabotage. How could he outsmart them? Because his eyes were closed, Abe didn't notice the trailing end of a cable flit past the office doorway. He also didn't see that the cable slither upward to disappear through the partly open trapdoor. He did, however, hear the click of the door closing. Abe's eyes shot open. He leaped out of his chair, hurried into the kitchen, and looked up at the trapdoor. Had he just imagined that sound? Abe looked around at the darkened Bobby Dot screens. He rubbed away the goosebumps that suddenly covered his arms. And that's it. And that's it. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, I don't even know how long this audiobook is because uh, I've been on and off recording. As I said, um, I feel like it's close to three hours. I, that could be completely wrong. It could be like two hours, honestly, but it felt like three hours. Oh my gosh. This story is obviously not finished. It's not finished, right? It's so like, there's a, it's a two-parter. So uh, when the Bobby Dots conclusion comes out, we are going to finally finish this story. So this is only half the story, uh, realistically. But what a, what a half of the story it is. Like, like, genuinely, there's so many cool elements to this story that I feel like can really be explored in the next part. And like... I want to know what you think is going to happen in the next part because I, I have my own theories. I'm going to be talking about it on the Dark Rooms podcast, which is my uh, the FNAF podcast that I'm part of um, with uh, Psychic Inky Ink and Underscore. And um, we, we're going to be talking about this because it's it's amazing. <laughs> it's such a good story. It's it's so much fun as well. I love all the characters. I love how we went into the, the West Arcade. I love how he went into the, the daycare and Fazza Blast. Honestly, this is a Fazza Blast to read through. Like, I am I enjoyed it so much. Uh, and I cannot wait to see what happens in the second part. I have a feeling, like, I'm going to make a prediction right now. And I, you can go back to this. Um, you can go back to this later. Like, once, once we've read the conclusion. And you can tell me if I was wrong or not. I have a feeling there is going to be a twist. I have a feeling there's going to be a massive twist. And that twist probably is going to be that some, something like the original Bobby Dots, uh, the Gen 1s, are probably the good guys. I, 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 genuinely think, I genuinely think that the Bobby Dots that Abe is seeing right now, Olive, Gemini and Rose, I have a feeling they are actually uh, like causing the, the, the things that are trying to kill Abe. And if that's the twist, then that is a, a great twist. The only thing is, they keep mentioning that. <laughs> they keep mentioning, like, are the Bobby Dots lying? So it makes me kind of think that that's just like a red herring. Anyway, I I have a feeling that they are the bad guys. And we're going to get that reveal uh, that, they, that they killed Landon or something. I'm wondering where it's going to go with his mom as well. I have a feeling his mom is dead or something like she hasn't been responding right has she been responding to his emails i can't really remember because as i say i've been reading this over a span of like two weeks so 
Uh, I am so sorry that this was really late, but um, it is out, so um, you're welcome. <laughs> but yeah, we still haven't finished this book though. Submechanophobia Epilogue is going to be next on the agenda, and then we are getting the Bobby Dots conclusion in May. Uh, no, not May, March. <laughs> March. A third of March, I believe it is. Anyway, thank you so, so, so much for listening. And I will see you then. Goodbye.